Revelation 2019. I'm going to begin by calling um, this meeting to order. I'm going to start with roll call of commissioners to my left. Marina Hartunian present. Chong Yang, present. Barbara Fisk, present. Bob Farrar, present. Bob Reyes, present. Thank you. Are there any um, communications at this time? Um, Chair, I would just like to add two items um, on the communications. One at the last commission meeting, I believe it was the board chair that asked um, staff to look into making the website um, visibility of the agenda package a little bit more clear to the public. And I wanted to report that we'd worked with the city's webmaster and have revised the HCDC web page to include a direct link to the city's legislative information center. So hopefully that will address the concerns that you've brought up in previous meetings. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And then additionally, I just wanted to let the commission know that you will be seeing more of a new member of our team in the future. Her name is Karen Jenks and she's in the audience today. Um, a city employee, a previous city employee that comes to us from this department, from the finance department. So she has some auditing and finance background that she's going to be adding to our housing division. And so again, this commission will be seeing more of Ms. Jinx in the future. Wonderful. Welcome, Ms. Jinx. Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, agenda item D, approval of um, today's agenda. Is there a motion to approve today's agenda? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor of, of approving today's agenda, please say aye. 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 Any nays? It looks like they were all ayes. All right. Next, we'd like to approve the minutes of uh, um, February 13, 2019 HCDC meeting. So moved. All second. Thank you. All in favor? of approving these minutes, please say aye. 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 Next, we move on to general administration. And um, what we have before us is a workshop and um, staff's gonna do an applicant presentation briefing for us. Thank you, Commission. I'm Kelly Furtado with the Housing and Community Development Division. And what I will be doing this evening is just going briefly through some slides that we prepared to go over the scoring process for this evening, not only for the benefit of the commissioners, but also for the benefit of the audience that is here today. So um, let's see, I wanted to just begin by, before I get into the calendar, making sure that the audience is aware, um, and I believe we emailed everybody, but the relaxed parking is in effect tonight. So um, there are no, there's no need to feed meters with coins out there if you weren't already aware of that. Um, definitely don't have to run out of here and do it again if you've already done it. Um, but the, the calendar in front of you and on the screen this evening is just a reminder of some of the deadlines that have already occurred. Um, clearly we're at the March 13th HCDC meeting agenda, and I just want to note that um, something that's not on the calendar after tonight, yet before the next couple of items on that calendar, there is a possibility that HUD will be announcing the city's allocation. So to date today, that has not occurred yet. Um, we expect it to happen at any time, but um, as you all know from experience up here, we, we don't have control of when HUD announces that allocation, and that is incredibly important to this process that we're all going through tonight, because it is only once that allocation is announced that we can work on the budget for our annual action plan with any certainty. However, because um, this plan is due to HUD on May the 15th of this year, we do have to begin this process. So we are on a pretty tight deadline to hear our applicant um, presentations tonight, make funding recommendations, um, and then what we will be doing as a staff is we then have about eight days to write a draft annual action plan based on the information that happens tonight um, and have it reviewed through our administration and then go out to the public for the required 30-day public review period. And so we're gonna be very busy bees after tonight, um, getting that all prepared. And our goal is to then come back to the Housing and Community Development Commission for a public hearing while the action plan is out in draft format for a public review. 
and then we will be coming to the council for a public hearing and consideration. We are aiming for April the 25th for that council meeting. And again, that's because HUD has a deadline of May the 15th. So that gives us a little bit of room um, to go back to council if that is required. Um, but that's, that's our deadline. So we're gonna be pretty busy the next couple of weeks. So tonight um, we'll be doing the staff presentation, hearing the agenda item, and we've got about 23, I think is what it was, applicants presenting this evening. Um, and we will be getting straight into then the funding recommendations before this meeting is over tonight. So our goal by the end of, the ton of tonight will have been to have heard all of the presentations, asked any questions that the commission finds necessary to rank or recommend funding recommendations, and um, that's what we'll be hoping to achieve before the night is over. Sometimes this meeting can be the longest one of the year, um, so we definitely want to thank the audience in advance for those that stick around to the end. Um, it, it may be a long evening depending on how, how much we all converse. The um, city review of the applications. So this is a bit different than we've done it last year. Over the years, um, the process continues to be improved. And as always, we welcome feedback, not only from those that are participants out in the audience, but also from our commissioners. And we had wanted to incorporate something that we heard loud and clear last year from our commissioners, which was um, in the scoring process and this um, presentation process to better understand uh, subrecipients' previous award situations and performance. So we're gonna be covering that a little bit this evening. And the, um, the methodology this year in the NOFA was published. So whenever back in February, the NOFA was put out on the street, every applicant had an opportunity to see exactly how they would be scored and exactly how many points would be assigned to that scoring process. And so um, what we did that's a little bit different than last year is we had our consultants come in and sit on the scoring panel with our project managers and our staff that are very familiar with many of these subrecipients. And we went through the ranking process, or the scoring process, I'm sorry, based on those scoring sheets. And those average scores are represented in your documentation this evening. Um, we definitely want to offer the opportunity for any of the applicants that want to discuss their scoring process and potential technical assistance for next year's funding, an opportunity to meet with the staff and go over and review that in greater detail. Um, but for the process of this evening and um, the timeliness of this evening's meeting, staff went ahead and scored and um, put the average scores in all of these. And I just wanna be very clear um, not only to the audience, but also to the commissioners, that the scoring is to inform the process. There is not a requirement or an expectation that based on the scoring, it impacts your ranking of the subrecipient applications or their funding recommendations. So I just wanna be clear on that. This is in, to inform the process. It is not to limit your ability to fund or um, rank the projects. Um, going on, I just wanted to, you know, one of the things that we have always committed to review in this process ahead of time is the eligibility. So we are able to review based on the information we are provided. And so I just want to be very clear that although some of the items in the package indicate eligible or partially eligible, that these are cursory reviews based on the information we received. As many of you know, um, HUD regulations are very complex. And so as we learn more about scopes of work and um, the nuances of each program, many of these agencies are new to the city of Fresno. And so we're not as familiar with their um, policies and procedures or their organizational capacity as we are of some of the others. So I wanna make sure that it's clear that this is not a formal determination of eligibility, um, but we will be going through that process as we do each year once applicants are awarded funds and we get through the technical part of the HUD eligibility requirements. So those are um, informal, but we're, we're usually pretty accurate on our, on our quick estimation in the beginning of this process. Um, something that commissioners are aware of, we're always considering in this process and it, and it tied into our scoring as well as timeliness. So um, we talked about the responsiveness in our bullet points up here. And I just wanna be very clear that you know we're always looking at shovel readiness of um, capital projects 
and also the timeliness in which organizations can begin implementing their program um, applications. And um, one, one comment, the last bullet point on this slide, I want to just uh, let the commission know that it's at your discretion, but staff is prepared to give a summary of our um, review of the projects, either before or after each presentation from the applicant. So right now we're set up to do it after their presentation, um, but it's at the commission's discretion when you'd like, and it can be limited to do 30 seconds. But what we'll be prepared to inform you of is whether or not they received prior year fundings in the last two years, and if they are on budget and on performance goals, and then any other um, clarifications or notes that we felt was significant to mention in this process tonight. Again, it will be about 30 seconds. It should be a very brief review for each one. The scoring methodology, it's, it's pretty apparent, but um, you, know, you wanna be consistent whenever you're doing items like this. You wanna be as transparent as possible. And again, I mentioned that any applicants that are interested in reviewing in greater detail the scoring or have technical assistance questions, we're gonna be ma making ourselves available. And um, each of the, the sheets that we used were out of 100, just to be clear on that. That was in the note for the scoring. The up two points were 100 points. Okay, so there we go, sorry. Um, so out to the public, we've made available a listing of the presentation order. And although we noted on there that times will vary, we wanna be incredibly clear, times are definitely going to vary. Um, we we may, maybe should have not even put times on there, but um, we tried to attempt to make an, a, you know, a little bit of a, a timed schedule, but we will be varying based on the questions and answer process of the commissioners. And so what we will stick to though is the order. So I'm hopeful that that page will be helpful to the um, audience as far as the order goes. We're going to be timing each up on the screen, very similar to anybody that's seen a council meeting. There's a three minute timer for the presentation that will um, be started. And if it's anything like it is in the council meeting at two minutes, it does a beep to kind of warn you that you're winding down. And then at three minutes, it does another that lets you know that time is up. So because we have over 20 applicants tonight, we're just asking that folks stick to that three minutes as best as possible. And then gives the commissioners an opportunity you know, commissioners have already reviewed the applications, but gives them an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions of the audience that they feel is helpful to making their decisions. Um, at this point, I'm just gonna hand it over to the city attorney's office briefly to also talk about this evening if there is a need for any of the commissioners to recuse themselves, to just talk through what that process is gonna look like. Good evening, commissioners. Um, generally speaking, if you believe you have a conflict due to an involvement with an agency that is presenting, the procedure would be to step out of the chamber uh, for the entire category when that agency presents. Then you can return to the chamber when the presentation is finished. And then you would again step out of the chamber when the funding recommendations for that category are being discussed and then return to the chamber afterwards. If anyone has any individual questions, about potential conflicts or whether or not there is a conflict at all, please come speak with me individually. We can have a side conversation. Malia, and, um, and we'll just need them to announce that they have a conflict as they're stepping out. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Okay, and so we've gone over everything else, and I'd mentioned to the group that the goal is to take a break um, as the presentation schedule indicates the goal would be to hear the presentations first and then take a short break for the commissioners to um, again take a break but also then to um, have some time individually because they would not be discussing this outside of this meeting um, in this public setting but giving them some individual time to compose their thoughts on their funding recommendations and ranking before we come back out for that section. I completely understand that schedules are not always adhered to, so it's at the chair's discretion how the break schedule happens. Um, but our goal is to try to get through the presentations before that occurs. Okay, so last couple of points. Um, not to, I, I really don't need to go into this again. The, the 
the funding recommendation will basically come back and it happens in categories. So we have a goal amount that we're trying to get to because we think that's how much of the allocation there will be. And so as always, our goal will be to recommend funding that adds up, you know, there's always more need than there is funding. And so we've got more requests than we can accommodate. So we try to pare it down to um, the groups that we want to recommend funding for. And again, we're going to be ranking them so that if HUD does decide to give the city of Fresno a little bit more money than we had estimated, then we'll know how the commission desires for those to be categorized or for them to be ranked. Um, leaving the process tonight, um, there is, as I mentioned earlier, there's gonna be a bit of activity um, in the staff side. So when the commission leaves this evening, if we achieve our goal of having a recommendation of funding, the staff will take that those recommendations and they will not be altered by the staff and they will be presented as the next agenda item suggests to the mayor and the city manager for consideration. That is what we use to complete the draft annual action plan. That is not the final annual action plan, that is the draft annual action plan that we then will be releasing to the public for a 30-day public review process and comment process. And so we are encouraging at this point and we will be doing it again after the release. We'll send lots of emails and social media to this effect, um, but we will be producing that for the 30-day review and that input will inform the final draft or the final action plan that will go in front of council for consideration in April. So um, that concludes my comments. So I will turn it back over to the commissioner. So before we begin, um, comments made by the applicants, um, commissioners, do you have a preference of when staff share information before we ask our questions or? or after we ask our questions? I do have a preference. I think it would be better if we do after because it won't you know, have an effect on the actual um, process of you know, us making a decision. So, we, so we're gonna have the presentations, then we will ask our questions of the presenter, and then we'll let staff sh share with us. That would be my preference. Sounds good. Okay. Okay with that. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you again all for being here. We are going to um, begin with our presentations. Um, and uh, Chair Frisk, um, I would have to recuse myself from the first section um, due to a conflict of interest. Thank you very much. Marina, we'll come and get you. If you just want to go out in the front lobby, we'll be sure to come out and get oh, you as soon as it's over. And Chair Fisk, if I could just state to you um, before the presentations begin, there was um, an, an information packet left on the commissioner's um, tables and will be included on our Legislative Information Center, but there were, there were three to four support letters submitted to the city council clerk um, after the applications were turned in, and in the application process specifically, we asked for only a certain number of letters of support, and we asked for them to be turned in with the application, so many of those are in the binders already for you and prepared for you. However, it was a, a bit unique that these letters came into the clerk's office afterwards, and so because of that, we just um, included them at your chair and we will include them in the record. Um, just wanted to give you some understanding of what they were what they were doing there. And um, it was from, it was, they were all in support of Valley Caregiver Resource Center. Um, so they'll, they'll be um, published in the record through legislative, the Legislative Information Center. But again, just wanted to give you an update on that, why they were in front of you. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so first, um, if you all have this list, this is the list that I'm gonna go off of. So our first presentation under the category of home repair is Habitat for Humanity. Hello, good evening. Um, so I'm here to, pr to present our um, application for uh, several of the categories. 
uh, Habitat is applying for six of the, I believe it's eight available categories. Uh, five of the categories uh, are lumped into a program that we currently already have in place. Uh, it is our home repair and rehabilitation program. Uh, within that program, we are uh, requesting funding for roofs, water heaters, um, critical items uh, that fall along, fall along the lines of um, plumbing and electrical, uh, HVAC, uh, and within that program also we address what we call minor repairs, uh, mostly focused uh, for senior clients. And then the second uh, program internally that we have structured is our senior paint program. Uh, and so uh, we are, our application reflects uh, six total categories. Um, and um, you've seen the uh, units that we are intending to deliver. Uh, myself, I am the, uh, I have the ability to, to see a little more than most because I am also the uh, inspector for our programs. I get to go into the homes and see the true need of uh, the applicants that live within our community. Uh, I wanted to uh, just take a moment to thank you for setting aside funding for home repairs. Uh, we, we, we obviously live in a state where affordable housing is, 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 a, is a large uh, topic that we are trying to address. Uh, and uh, within my world, I believe that the uh, foundation of affordable housing lies in our ability to preserve the existing ho housing element. And so um, thank you for, for giving us the ability to, to, to perform these repairs. Okay, oh, I could keep going. <laughs> uh, and so within those, we obviously see the needs uh, of many of our clients being uh, older adults. And so uh, we see the entire package, which I alluded to earlier, as an entire program uh, looking at the home holistically and addressing um, the needs of a homeowner so they can continue to stay in their home safe and independently. And all those needs are quite honestly, um, all along the lines of all the categories that we have uh, the ability to choose from. And so we, we do appreciate the ability to uh, serve a homeowner that has a need for a um, water heater as well as a heater or air conditioner, especially in the climate we live in, or roof repair or replacement, uh, as well as maybe getting accessibility items. Uh, and so uh, I do, again, appreciate all this. Thank you. Thank you. If you could um, stay for questions. And I'm sorry, what's your name again? Jerry Zuniga. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Zuniga? I understand it's um, targeting the seniors. Um, how many families are you guys um, hoping to reach in terms of this um, services and funding? So we are... Uh, measuring it in terms of units of homes um, and so we are proposing 55 homes to be uh, uh, addressed through the entire funding amount uh, within that we have uh, the senior paint program which we have allocated for 20 homes uh, just for those uh, and the rest of it being allocated for the uh, what we consider critical repair and so um, we are hoping to deliver beyond that and be fiscally responsible with the money that we would be uh, um, awarded. So, uh, but it's, we want to have, have a realistic number that we can start from, and that, that's the 55 units that we've provided in the application. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, in dealing with your seniors, uh, do they participate? Uh, as far as any, obviously, they're not going to get up on a roof and, <laughs> and, and install a roof, but do, do they participate like some of the other projects? Uh, not in the traditional habitat sense. We, uh, in fact, that's why we are asking for CDBG funding for grants 
Uh, so that way there is no also no payback necessary. Um, we know that the average income of our older adults is on par, or someone with Social Security is on par with the national poverty rate. So we couldn't see it in our uh, world to, to ask for any assistance in monetary wise. And, and because I get to see the many people that we're trying to assist, uh, I can tell you uh, wholeheartedly that for them to basically get out of the house has been you know, a tremendous task. And so um, I, I don't foresee us trying to, to ask for any physical assistance. Um, we want to be able to uh, preserve the housing stock, but also preserve the quality of life for the individuals living within the homes. Uh, and so that's why we've structured the application to, give, to ask for grant uh, and and no to answer your question no no need for um, any type of physical uh, co-laboring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zunovan. Thank you. Further questions, I'm going to go ahead and give the staff review. So we did determine that the Habitat application was eligible. We have um, worked with them for the 2017 year with the, a previous award in the amount of $199,777. Um, currently of that, 50, a little under 50000 has been expended. And um, they had a goal of 20 people to be served or perhaps units and um, or housing units and our records indicate that five have been to date and we also have a pending agreement extension on that 2017 contract. Um, there's also been an award for 2018 in the amount of $215,000 with a goal of 55 individuals served um, and if I Let's see, yes, and we've um, worked at possibly reducing that goal a little bit based on them implementing their program, because if you'll recall, 2017 was the first year Habitat got this award from CDBG, and there was some capacity building on that first year involved. So um, the, second, the second year, the 2018 year, has not been expended yet, but um, that's 2018, uh, December of 2018 is when the insurance certificate was approved, and so they have not had many months in that new agreement to start implementing, and so they're clearly working on the 2017 first. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurt Hurtado. Okay, so next we're going to hear from um, the Self-Help Enterprises. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Susan Long. I'm a program director at Self-Help Enterprises over our housing rehab program. Self-Help has been um, operating housing rehab programs in the Central Valley, eight counties is our service area from Stanislaus to Kern County. Um, we are, our home base is in Visalia, but we work in all eight counties. Um, we have been doing housing rehab since the early 70s. Last year was the first year that um, we applied for funds through the City of Fresno and were awarded funds. Um, we are currently requesting $502,000 to assist 15 households with housing rehabilitation services consisting of five components. The services provided are a bit more extensive um, although they are listed as emergency type repairs, roof repairs, and minor repairs, based on the experience we've encountered so far under our current contract, we have found there to be a higher demand for um, larger amount of funding due to the extensive amount of work that's often needed. Um, we would, of course, love to continue to provide this assistance to households within the city of Fresno, primarily seniors and those located within the city's target area. Um, we continue to work with Fresno City staff to ensure that the program is fitting for the city of Fresno. Although we have extensive experience with the program itself, um, every community is unique and there is a need to um, design that programs to specifically meet 
the clientele that you're serving. I know that was really quick, but I think I really summed it up. <laughs> That's fine, Ms. Long. We could, um, if you don't mind, commissioners, if you have any questions. You know, I just want to make this uh, very clear. Um, the funding that you're requesting is for five components. Correct. Of housing rehabilitation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Long has already covered what um, I was going to include in the staff review that the only funding received through this process was in 2018 and that was for $500,000. And um, just to talk to the comprehensive nature of getting the first contact tracked through, this agency is familiar with other federal funding sources and they have a lot of capacity and we were just able to complete the insurance approval portion of our contract in February of this year. So it's, it takes some time. So the fact that there have been no expenditures to date is um, reflective of the fact that the contract was fully executed and the insurance requirements were just met last month. Ms. Hurt, thank you so yeah. much, Ms. Long. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Hurt, Ms. Hurtado, so with those, both of those um, organizations, Habitat and Self Help, having their insurance certificates just awarded not too long ago. Is there any difficulty in extending the time period that they have to, to finish these projects? No, um, clearly we're always worried about timeliness, um, but there's no risk to their programs or their projects. And as I'd mentioned with the Habitat project, they had previous funds as well, so they're still expending from their current contract, but there's no um, risk at this moment of an expiration of their funds or their agreements, and they're operating within the regulations, and we anticipate them expending in a reasonable manner. Thank you very much. Next, um, the next category that we will be hearing from is the homeless services presentations. Um, with ESG funds, and we're going to begin with Marjorie Mason Center. And just before Marjorie Mason Center begins, oh, if yes. I could just ask that um, maybe one of our staff members goes and invites Ms. Yes, thank you, the commissioner back in. Thank you. Thank I you. It's, very... it's taken care of. <laughs> thank you for coming to the podium. If you could wait um, a couple of minutes until our commissioner comes back to her seat, that would be great. Thank you. I'll just take this opportunity to let the audience know that the podium in front of you is adjusting. So rather than moving the microphone, if you are either vertically challenged or not, there's a button on there that will raise the entire podium up or down. Um, I have personally found that to be very helpful and not many people know about it. So as we're waiting for the commissioner to be seated, I just wanted to announce that. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Ruby Mavian, and I am the emergency services manager at the Marjorie Mason Center. I oversee our safe, emergency safe house operations as well as our rapid rehousing program. And I am here on behalf of MMC to request funding to continue to provide services to individuals and families experiencing homelessness due to domestic violence. In 2017-2018 uh, fiscal year, MMC was able to provide rapid rehousing for 93 um, individuals, which included adults and children, with over 7,800 nights of rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing assisted with security deposit to move into their safe home, as well as three months of rental assistance. Also, thanks to the ESG funds from the city, we were able to provide uh, 500 adults and children out of the 829 with emergency safe housing, uh, which included motels with over 27,000 nights of safe housing. Um, just a little statistics, in 2017, six women were murdered by their intimate, current, or former partner, and the first murder in 2019 in the city of Fresno was domestic violence related. That is why it's very vital for us to be requesting these services so that we can continue to provide safe housing for individuals and families. We want to thank you for the previous funding that we've received to assist us, and we do um, appreciate your consideration for funding for the next fiscal year. Thank you very much. If you can um, wait one moment. Sure. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Yeah.
you know, thank you for those information and the work that you guys do. Um, I was just curious um, with the data that you were sharing um, in terms of the emergency safe housing mm -hmm. that you guys were able to house 500 out of 829. Mm -hmm. um, is it because uh, there wasn't enough emergency safe housing available? Is that why um, some of those individuals that needed safe housing wasn't uh, able to get housing? Well, in regards to emergency safe housing, if we are full, which we always are, we do um, use the motel for the families until we have room opening up. But um, funding-wise, we were able to, with the ESG funding, we were able to assist a little bit over 500 families out of the 829. For the 829, that's how many people we actually served in our emergency shelter. So the ESG helped 500 of those clients, and other funding helped the other. OK, perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. So you're not turning anyone away? We, we will not turn anyone away that is a domestic violence victim. Uh, so when the police, do the police bring these people to you? We have, um, we have had the police bring the people over. It could be a self-referral. It could be from other partnering agencies who suggest that they come to us. Um, it could be the 211 hotline, the domestic violence hotline. They can come to us. They can be referred to us from hospitals, schools. But yes, PD does work in close partnership with us, and they have brought us victims. Thank you. I have a question. Um, what Could you just briefly describe your outreach our outreach, sure. So um, we do attend events in the community. We have an outreach outreach booth. We have an education team that goes out and educates the community about domestic violence, um, red flags, and what healthy relationships should look like. We also have our education team that goes out to the schools in Fresno, middle schools and high schools, and a few colleges to educate um, the students on what a healthy relationship should look like. We also have the 40-hour domestic violence um, training that we do a couple of times a year, and that's open to the community. Um, and that also educates um, the community on what domestic violence is and how we can, I can't say put an end, but decrease um, more victimization. That number that you mentioned earlier, where would someone find that? I'm sorry? The number that you mentioned earlier, the speed dial, where would someone see that? The statistics that I gave? No, 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 the 211, was it? Oh, the 211? Mm -hmm. um, that's Fresno United Way. Um, we have a resource list that anytime we get, even if we get a victim that's not DV, anytime someone comes through our doors, we don't turn them away. We have a resource referral list that includes the 211 number on there, among other partnering agencies that we have. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So, um, 2017, Marjorie Mason Center did get an award, and it was through ESG for $226,863. To date, they have expended little over 214,000 of that, so they are on time with their invoicing. 2018, um, that was $319,890 award, and they have expended 101, a little over 101,000 of that already. So um, they are on budget and on point with the budget, and um, they've already discussed a lot of their, their numbers, but um, the goals that we had for 17 and 18 were also, um, if they weren't reached, they were very close or exceeded. So they've been performing both on the budget and in the performance metrics. And they're eligible, if I, I think I missed that part. They're, they're an eligible activity. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Next, we will have the Pavarello, Pavarello House. Is it? Good evening, Commissioners. Cruz Avila from the Pavarello House. <clears throat> so, Pavarello House is requesting 15000 um, under the emergency shelter and street outreach portion of the ESG grant here through the city. Um, 15000 will be used for 14 uh, hotel vouchers. And so combined with the 15,000, the matching funds would also be utilized to be able to help um, our homeless families, uh, homeless veterans, and also the homeless youth aging out of the foster care system as well. Um, within the last three years, because we run a fiscal year from <clears throat> September to October each year, in 2016, we were able to, to supply 
services and case management to 60 adults and 92 children. Uh, 2017 to 2018, 65 individuals and 105 children. And then as we uh, stepped into 2018, we're um, helping 30 individuals and 36 uh, children at this time. So currently rolled one family <clears throat> and one is pending. And then also just some additional highlights um, with these ESG funds, um, low barrier access, um, only program that allows men head of household with the female children <clears throat> and who accepts boys above a certain age. And then program is very busy in the early to late uh, summer months. And then children are enrolled in school as they're going through these programs as well. And then case management included, um, although it's not charged um, in the current grant application. So we're able to provide those services. So just some of those highlights and the request and the ask is for 15,000. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any questions? You know, I've worked with foster youth in the past, and I was curious, um, the foster youth you guys are working with are the foster youth that are emancipating, right? Correct. And so do you help them after providing them the temporary, you know, housing or the hotel vouchers to find permanent housing after that? Correct. So we're not only working with the school districts, working with the city, working with the county, working with all uh, parties that need be to be able to help the, the foster youth get back on track or find a, a permanent home, permanent supportive services, um, depending on the, the case of each of the individual or each of the family that comes in, uh, we're providing services to. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Could you describe the average stay at uh, the uh, temporary housing at the hotel, for the hotel voucher? So. Normally, it's about seven days. Sometimes it overlaps uh, the seven days, just depending if there's an available um, apartment unit uh, for these families or individuals, uh, veterans that we're working with. So it all depends on the available units after the uh, voucher stay. So, but it's usually a maximum of seven days. Thank you. And do you mind explaining a little bit more what you meant by this? It's the only program that men can have their children with them. And so when so when we refer to that, it's uh, sometimes there's uh, there's barriers for uh, single men to have their their children with them uh, in some of these uh, programs, and so we're um, as the mission for the PAV, it's uh, we're rich in life experience of all who come our way, no questions asked. So we're helping if it's just a, a single dad with the household, we're able to help them through that process. Whereas some programs may not be able to do that, uh, the PAV is able to do that with this voucher program as well. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. So the Pavarello House is an eligible activity. They have received funding through ESG in program year 17 in the amount of $20,000. And um, while we understand that they are serving, we have not expended those funds to date. Um, also for 2018, it was the amount of $11,000, and again, zero is expended. Um, and Mr. Avila discussed the um, performance of the, the service, so I'm not going to get into that again. So that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Next, we will be hearing from West Care, California. Good evening, Commissioners. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Maria Rodriguez. I'm the program director for housing services with Westcare, which uh, Westcare has been a, it's a social service organization that has been um, serving, providing services to the community for over 45 years. Westcare has um, had ESG services for the la at least four um, years. And since the inception of the program, we have been able to serve 311 um, individuals with rapid rehousing services, 148 with um, homeless prevention, and in the 2018 um, annual point in time count data, it showed that out of the 1871 individuals experiencing homelessness um, here in, uh, in the community, 86% of them were unsheltered. Um, 
86% of them were on shelter and or living in a place that meant prohibit habitation. So this funding is imperative for us to continue providing services um, here in the city of Fresno. Our goals with this grant is that through outreach, we're able to establish um, supportive relationships with the street homeless population to be able to link them to services. Um, through our case management, we're hoping to assist 12 individuals with homeless prevention, 50 with rental assistance, and 62 with case management services. Um, to increase participants' income and their ability to be able to um, obtain housing and be able to sustain it after the assistance is over. Um, and ultimately to be um, able to assist participants to establish and maintain a healthy uh, lifestyle. And just as a highlight, um, through our past um, completed funded project term, we, anticipate, we anticipated serving 50 individuals with rapid housing and 12 with homeless prevention. And I'm happy to say that we actually surpassed our goal. We ended up serving 69 individuals with rapid housing and 33 with homeless prevention. Um, and with both uh, combined programs, we were able to house 36 children. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Ms. Rodriguez? I just had one, Ms. Rodriguez. Okay. I noticed that um, a list of, in the list of funding sources, um, it looked like the primary funding source was the Department of Veterans Affairs um, for almost $4 million. Does that, in, does that influence who you are able to um, to serve? No, we only use our ESG funding for the specific numbers. Okay. Thank you very much. No. Okay, so this is an eligible activity for West Care, and the funding received in 2017 was $260,279, and expended is a little bit over 175000 so they are on track with the budget there, and I won't uh, repeat the numbers, as she's um, already given you a good identification of the performance. Um, program year 2018, the award was $191,222, and already expended to date is a little bit over $97,000. So they are also on track with their budget performance. Thank you very much. So for, um, for the next category, for HOPWA, do we, um, does West Coast come back and present again? Yes, okay, thank you very much. You're making your way up. Appreciate that. Um, just to answer your question about veteran services, all of those funds are earmarked solely for veterans of general discharge or better and cannot be spent on the fun, uh, clients that currently are served through other ESG funding. So we link everybody to the VA uh, SSVF program. My name is Lynn Pimentel and I'm the Deputy Administrator for WestCare. I oversee all community-based programs including treatment, housing, HIV AIDS services, uh, adolescent and adult outpatient and residential treatment. I'm here tonight to talk to you about our HOPA project, which is housing opportunities for people living with AIDS. We are the only provider between Fresno, I'm sorry, between San Francisco and Los Angeles serving this population. Currently in Fresno County alone, there are over 3,600 3, positives that are identified and many more who are unidentified because of lack of resources for testing. Our HOPA program is defined as housing equals medical care, housing equals wellness, and our intent is to suppress the virus, eradicate uh, contagions to others through unprotected sex, and to push forward education on prevention. In Fresno County alone last year, 18 transitional age youth leaving foster care 18 and under were positive for HIV through unprotected sex. 18 children. And we don't even know how many they also had sex with. We also had a Fresno State College student who works full time, 24 years old, went to the dentist. The dentist got stuck. Last week, she received a FedEx envelope saying, you're positive. So it's an equal opportunity destroyer. The HOPA budget not only includes housing opportunities, but prevention, testing, outreach, education, prep and PEP navigation, which is a preventative, a prophylactic, 
and transitional living as well as substance abuse treatment and mental health services. Our intent is to groom folks for permanent housing through this project, to find them, engage them, I'm looking at the clock, um, and educate those all around them to reduce stigma and encourage the community to embrace them as people who are in need and not uh, um, lepers. So thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, any questions? That's a good sign. Thank you. Thank you. So this is clearly an eligible expense and um, the 2017 award was for $428,066 and currently expended is over 188,000 of that. Um, they had a goal of 50 served and have already served 42. So they're nearing their performance goals on both the budget and the um, delivery to services. Program year 18, the award was $441,304, and they've already expended $263,000. Again, the goals to serve were 65, and already served to date is 41. So again, well on their way, both budget-wise and by service. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear from um, those who are applying for CDBG facility improvement. Um, Funds. We're going to begin with the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you, Commissioners. Good evening. I'm Diane Carbray. I'm the President and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club. Um, this proposal is for the Boys and Girls Club to make facility improvements to the roof on our West Fresno Club. The West Fresno Club has been operational for 70 years. It was our first club opened in 1949. We renovated the building in 2005, and now the roof is in need of replacement. We own the building, and it's on a lease with the city. It's a 99-year lease, and we are in year 62. We've secured pro bono services from a local construction company, Mark Wilson Construction, to serve as project manager on behalf of the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and. Uh, the club itself is located at 930 Tulare Street. We've uh, obtained two bids. The roofing company, the one of them will furnish all labor, materials, equipment, supervision, and insurance necessary to complete the work. The request for CDBG funds is at a cost of 145500 The actual proposal with the details is itemized in each of your packets. It's only a portion of the building, but it is of major concern. The roof of the entire West Fresno Club has, is almost 16,000 square feet and needs to be replaced. The existing roof is in major need um, because it has leaks, potential mold, and is creating unsafe conditions for youth and staff housed inside the club. An update, unfortunately, the timeliness of this application. application we've had two weeks of rain, severe wind, and um, the club has based, the roof has started to disintegrate. So during this past storm, we have now closed the club, and it's at least until temporary repairs can be done to the roof. Um, raid damage has made the club unsafe, and that's why we had to close it. It's water damage to the walls and books in the library. There's a half inch of water on the gymnasium floor leaking over the entrance to the lobby and numerous places that needs to be patched. Over 2,150 unduplicated youth, teens, and parents, and community guests benefit from this project. Many West Fresno neighborhood residents come to the club for holiday events, health fairs, and other activities. This past year, we had 468 club members and an outreach of 1,700. So it's vital to get the club reopened. Uh, we are prepared to patch it. We have a bid for $12,000 to get us through these next few rainstorms um, and get it open, cleaned up and open. But it, the roof has to be repaired, but, and we're prepared to wait until the funding comes available to do that. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Okay. 
Thank All right, you. thank you so much. This is um, believed to be an eligible expense, and there are no previous uh, facility capital improvement awards given to the Boys and Girls Club in the last two years. However, I would just like to note that they are a recipient of some of the public service funds, and they are a subrecipient that performs on budget and on time and meets their goals. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from the Fresno County Economic Opportunities Commission. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Crystal Streets, and I'm representing Fresno EOC's Sanctuary Transitional Shelter. We have applied for $386,413 for renovations for our transitional shelter. We have the only transitional shelter that serves homeless youth ages 18 to 24 and their families. The youth can stay for up to 90 days, and while they're there, we are getting them services related to housing and anything else they need from substance abuse, job placement, school training, anything that they might need while they're there. Currently, right now, we have, Fresno EOC has owned this building since 1999. Prior to it being a transitional shelter, it was a transitional living facility for youth. However, the funding was lost, and we were fortunate to have funding to open up a transitional shelter in 2017. Last year alone, we were able to serve over 150 um, transitional aged youth with either going into a housing program, reunifying with their family, or being able to self-resolve and get their own apartment or housing. Um, the renovations will go to um, fix our HVAC system, windows, paint, security, gates, lighting, phone systems, um, and just an overall renovation of this building that is old and need of some trans some TLC. Um, that's it. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. So the um, EOC does not have two, any experience in the last two years with a capital improvement project in the public facilities category with us. Um, and you'll notice that it says on the eligibility portions eligible. I just wanted to note that um, under staff's review, the only item that seemed to be potentially concerning um, as far as identifying a national objective and qualifying it as eligible was the phone system. And as I understand it, that's only about $10,000 of the total request. So that is the only comment that staff would like to bring up is that the phone systems may be a challenge to document as eligible. So we would not want to fund that if that were found to be the case. Thank you very much. Next, we, were gonna, um, we will hear from the helper, excuse me, helping others pursue excellence, hope. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lanisha, and I'm the director for Helping Others Pursue Excellence. And I also have our um, mentor supervisor, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Williams, here if you have any additional questions. But uh, we are seeking your support of, 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 of gosh, of, of, <laughs> of uh, building infrastructure support to be able to uh, improve our roof. Um, currently, our roof is pretty much in an unsafe um, so, you know, support structures. Gosh, can I start all over? <laughs> so a little bit about Vision View. Vision View is, in, is a place where we are providing capacity services for low-income residents, Section 3 residents, what we consider um, by definition by HUD, um, income, low-income qualifying. Um, either they live in affordable housing or they, you know, have some sort of, uh, they qualify for income through their income. Look here, today is this. <laughs> Good evening, Jacqueline Williams. Um, as Alicia was saying, as a HUD Section 3 um, eligible organization, we are helping individuals um, with employment opportunities as well as employers gaining eligible employees. So 
what we're providing is services to help them end up in out of poverty. And at the same time, the facilities that we are here to request funds for is going to house an opportunity for training in the areas of retail and for food services. And those services will be um, eligible, meet the eligibility as well as for the, the tenants who may be in public housing or the employers that we're connecting to the project who have a employment, um, an employee pool of 51% or more who meet the criteria. Anything else you want to add to that? Yes, so um, the ask today again is for the roof and um, this would allow us to provide safe access for those services that we you know, propose to uh, provide for the intended benefit of our Section 3 residents and business concerns. Um, we also help small businesses build business capacity, so we provide all those types of services. The microphone, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so the, the intended benefit will benefit our low-income residents and uh, what we call Section 3 businesses um, that provide job training services or any kind of business that we can con uh, match contractors with uh, any kind of work that a contractor is working on, maybe a public housing infrastructure project or um, a housing project, we're able to match those contractors. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Um, Lanisha, thank you for um, your presentation. Um, for the workforce development, um, I just, wonder do you have a program apart from the theoretical part do they do they get a practice anywhere and where and and where that is yes okay so um what we do is we really try and focus on building a person's capacity so let's say for example hud invested a hundred thousand dollars in our community and they they said they recommend to be in compliance that we have to hire uh, a low-income person or section three qualified business well, we take that particular person and guide them through the entire step to be able to do business with that contractor. How, are they, how do they become eligible? Let's say they need an actual contractor's license. Let's say they need a bond. Let's say they need um, an actual tax ID, a business license, and whatever else they need. So aside from um, the services that we offer on site, we're really out in the community ensuring that we're matching our contractors with the opportunities that exist throughout our city so it would more you would describe it more as a startup support both so like or workforce for example, development workforce development and business formation startup um, enterprises so as an example last year we served we we got funding uh, intended for only five participants well we ended up in, ended up serving 82 um, residents and that was a mix of 34 businesses that we helped to build their business capacity. So to this date, we're guiding them through the entire process. They either started a nonprofit or LLC or for-profit, whatever their legal structure was. And, um, and then as well as place 62 businesses on the job or on job training. And so we specifically work with those contractors that are saying, hey, where are all these participants at? We can't meet our hiring compliance goals that HUD is, is in, you know, in effect put, placing on us um, because either they're not applying or they're not, you know, they're not seeing where they are. So we're basically bringing those residents to the contractors. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the structure of the organization. So if someone comes up um, to you and says that they need support in finding job and they need job training, but not necessarily to become a businessman, what would be your program to include them? Yes, so um, a couple of things. So we have created different enterprises right there at Vision View. So like for example, um, we are right now getting ready to launch a coffee shop. And with the coffee shop, we're creating specific pathways where a person can learn all of the back-end opportunities of, of, of maybe uh, accounting, uh, administ office administration, marketing, inventory control, customer service, um, and not only just, you know, maybe prepping, prepping in, the, in the cafe, but a lot of the back-end support. So we are doing this dual program where we're providing on-the-job training so they can build the skills to be able to go back out and, and work in the community, as well as developing the business owners to be able to say, instead of starting a business and you don't really have the capacity or you don't know where to start, 
allow us to create this enterprise where we're guiding you through it and you have the support structure um, right there on site. So we're creating enterprises and, and also working with the community partners. Thank you, Linda Jill. Thank you very much. Yeah, I got a question. I'm curious, what is the condition of the roof right now? I know that it's built since 1979. Yes, uh, similar to, um, as shared with the Boys and Girls Club, um, we too are experiencing a, wear, a, a major wear on our roof. Um, one of our roofs were compromised about two years ago and actually collapsed. And so the fear is that we can do some preventative. What we're doing now is doing preventative to ensure that does not happen. We clean the drains often. Um, now that this rain is beaten down, literally we're finding leaks and holes here and there. So uh, we too are faced with um, for being able to continue to provide safe access without shutting that part of the building down. Uh, Alicia, thank you for your presentation. Do you own the building? Uh, the nonprofit does, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And how big is the roof? How big is the building? 33,000 square feet. So it's three separate buildings. Okay, so it's it's quite large. And one, you're requesting 150, and that's going to cover that? Uh, 5,000 square foot. Oh, sorry. 5,000 square foot of one of the buildings. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, there are, um, there's a note that it's portions eligible. So to describe that a little bit further, um, and Lanisha and her organization have been working with the city for a couple of years on funding and receive guidance and technical assistance, especially through our consultants that came on back in October um, more recently. But the, the explanation for the portions eligible just simply have to do with the size and the volume of and variety of activities happening on site. She'd mentioned Vision View. That's the, if, if I can kind of paraphrase, it's the overarching name of the three buildings. And the um, portions eligible are basically um, a, a percentage of the activities that are happening within all of those buildings that are CDBG eligible. So to give you an example, um, at a recent on-site visit, our team went out and walked the, the property with Ms. Senegal, and we determined that about 92% of the property is CDBG eligible. So what that means in my world is that, um, let's just use some easy math for their, for a $100,000 investment that they requested, that would mean that the CDBG portion could only fund $92,000 of a $100,000 project. So because there, there is a small percentage of activity there that may not be qualifying as CDBG eligible, we have to prorate the percentage of funding that they can utilize from CDBG. So that's all that the portions eligible is. It's not the activity, it's just the portions of the activity related to the overall um, proportion of the facilities. Um, so I just wanted, that's, that's a long explanation, but I wanted you to understand that, and that's something that we're very clear on in our office, they're very clear on, and we're working with them to make sure that that's documented properly, and that moving forward, we're accounting for that appropriately. Um, they have received in this category two prior year awards. In 2017, it had to do with an elevator, um, $100,000, you may recall, and that has not been expended, but um, I am happy to report that after a site agreement was obtained with the elevator vendor based on the city's requirements um, that that project is now moving forward so we expect that to be happening soon um, and the program year 18 money uh, funding was for $35,000 um, and that was for some ADA improvements and again zero dollars have been expended to this point but we um, anticipate some progress soon thank you very much next we have St. Rest Community Economic Development Corporation presenting Good evening, Housing and Community Development Commission and city staff. St. Rast Community Economic Development Corporation submitted a $50,000 request for public and community facility improvements for lighting, seat benches, and shade structures of the open public space St. Rast Plaza on Elm. 
St. Russ Plaza on Elm is a beacon of hope that is situated in the King and Kirk School neighborhoods and a part of the Elm Avenue revitalization plan on the southwest corner of Elm Avenue and Reverend Chester Riggins. As you are aware, the, the area is in desperate need of improvement. As a church and community benefit organization, we are doing just that, um, revitalizing the area. Before the plaza, the land was vacant and contaminated for decades. Today, the St. Russ Plaza on Elm has brought an innumerable amount of organizations, community partners, and residents together for multiple community build days for this tactical urbanism project. Together, we built a stage, painted a mural, children painted all the lettering and the wood shapes that you will see out there. Um, teenagers from Edison High School used a saw for the first time during our building day projects to cut out shapes and different things that we have for our decor. And as a community, over a four-week period, we built an open space to be used for anyone to use. The community is excited for its use. Our neighborhood is, is a food desert, um, and our residents live in severe poverty. Um, we'll be hosting an outdoor farmer's market starting next month. The space is open for community block parties, ice cream socials, Saturday sports, youth events, food distribution, and much more. We are requesting your investment for lights, shade, and seating. Well-lit public spaces increase safety and boost confidence of residents. Lighting also plays an integral role in community building. Further, we can, get the, we can use the space in its full capacity to host um, evening movie nights in partnership with Fresno PD in the evening. Um, light is also necessary for all year round activities. The shade structure is necessary all year round, especially during the hot weather. Shade will provide shelter from the sun, wind, um, and residents will spend more time outdoors in the open space if there is shade during sun, rain, and all seasons. The permanent seating will allow us to spend more time outdoors, which is a benefit of mental health and allows people to connect with other community. Um, seating also increases the value and beautification of the plaza. And it also um, increases the beautification in the plaza and in future investment. With your support, together we can make Fresno a better place and more attractive. And we thank you for your service, and we welcome your partnership in any questions. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Okay. The uh, 35000 37000 for the canopy, you've costed that out. You've got a company that has proposed that to you? Yes. Yeah, so we have spoken to IBEW um, and... That cost can possibly come down. We're looking at maybe um, they might be able to provide some volunteer hours, but without the volunteer hours, that is the price. How big of a canopy are you talking about, and how many people would be able to be under it? We're looking at a couple of different shade structures. So I don't have the exact specs with me right now. Okay. Any other questions? I am. Can you refresh my memory? Who owns the plaza? St. Rest Baptist Church. And then um, maybe just a, because we had a shade structure going into our neighborhood park. That was, I was surprised at the cost of it. Is it like a shade structure that's going to go over a picnic table? Or is it a chase structure that's going to cover like a wider area? So without touching the mic and squatting because I'm just a little bit taller, raise, like ask Jesus to raise it up? Yeah. <laughs> Come Lord, rise me Jesus. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, due to the, 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 hello, thank you everyone for, for um, taking, our, our, our taking time out of your day. Um, but due to uh, where we sit in, in southwest Fresno, as you know, the sun beats extremely hard, especially on the area where the plaza sits. So we're not looking at it to cover the entire area because 
we're also going to have uh, opportunities for community gardening, for opportunities for people to sit, to enjoy the sun. We're looking at probably a, a structure that would maybe hold maybe roughly about 50 to 60 individuals if you're sitting down underneath that structure. But depending on the amount uh, that we have uh, will depend on the length and the, the size of the way that structure that uh, covering will, will look. So we're not looking at something that will cover the entire plaza. We're looking at something that will cover maybe a, a corner of the plaza or maybe even uh, the middle of our plaza so that individuals can sit comfortably, whether it's sun beating down on them or even if there's a little bit of a drizzle, they can still sit and enjoy uh, one of the greatest preachers in Fresno preach, which is me. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Pastor Kreiner. Any, um, any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So this, this activity is also noted as portions eligible, and because this is a new um, proposal that we were not as familiar with as some of the others, um, staff was making a distinguishing line between permanent fixtures and fixtures that may not be so permanent. Like in the application, there were things like umbrellas and chairs, things of that nature. So HUD has some pretty specific regulations regarding what would be eligible. So we would need to um, do some additional consulting on the scope of work with the applicant to have a very clear definition of how much of that would and would not be eligible. Clearly a large size canopy is the one that is the bulk of this request would be an eligible portion of that. It's the things that could, could pick up and move off that may not be. Um, and then again, um, we'd also want to do some more conversation and discussion with the applicant on the community events to make sure that they were CDBG eligible. As I'd mentioned with the previous applicant, you want to determine the eligibility of the activities in the community center to ensure that it would be 100% CDBG eligible. So um, those are all things that we believe with some further discussion we could refine should um, the commission wish to pursue funding with this agency. Thank you very much. Next, um, we will be hearing from Wesley United Methodist Church. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Karen Pugh, the pastor of Wesley United Methodist Church, and I would like to introduce Wesley to you. From its very beginning, they were community partners with agencies in Fresno. Because of the uh, long refugees that came to the neighborhood, they began to, the Wesley community, serve that community. And out of that, that organization gave birth to Stone Soup. When First United Methodist Church joined us, they brought with them their legacy of being founders of the Marjorie Mason Center and Fresno Metro Ministries, some of the same agencies that you're seeing in front of you today. And that culture continues at Wesley. We have a food pantry that distributes 60 food bags uh, a week to families in the neighborhood and in Fresno. We have a Thursday night meal program that feeds over 100 people every week. We have a boys and girls club on our campus. We have dozens of recovery groups. And we have many ways that we reach out to the community and partner to make El Dorado Park in Fresno uh, a better place to live for everyone. And I want to introduce uh, Mark Leos, who is our trustees chair, who will talk about the project. Thank you, as Karen said, uh, my name is Mark Leos. I'm the board of trustee chair at Wesley United Methodist Church, and we're honored to be here in front of you today. And we're honored to be participating with, for these funds uh, with these uh, very impressive groups uh, behind, us, behind me today. Um, Wesley finds itself in a unique p situation. Um, we're a church that gives and serves. We put a focus on people and programs, not buildings and facilities. So we're finding ourselves with leaky roofs bathrooms that need to be remodeled, HVAC that needs to be replaced, irrigation, drainage that needs to drain the right direction, and uh, computer infrastructure that needs to be improved. So that's why I'm here w for you today to ask for help improving these things that 
will help us in the future uh, continue to be a vital and uh, important uh, change agent in the neighborhood that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, any questions? How, how old is the, um, the building or the, that you're trying to fix? Um, uh, the buildings, um, they were built at different times. Uh, one in, uh, the latest one was in 1984, uh, uh, 1975, and 84. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commission, the city does not have past experience working in the last two years with Wesley United Methodist Church on any facility improvements through this funding source. Um, the portions eligible notation in the packets simply um, is addressing two items within the application. So we were challenged with identifying how the thrift store portion of the repairs um, and again, as um, they indicated, that's, there's multiple buildings involved. So this would be one of the buildings. Um, because of the use, we have a challenge with identifying how that would become eligible. And then the Wi-Fi improvements, the technology improvements, those are two areas that we are uncertain about, uncertain about the eligibility. And um, again, we would work with the applicant, but um, those are our concerns for this application. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Westcare California Incorporated. That tall man. I'm still Lynn Pimentel, Deputy Administrator for Westcare. Now I have my hat on in terms of facilities. Our Martin Luther King residential program on the corner of um, MLK Boulevard in Annadale was built in the late 50s, and it was a 15,000 square foot convalescent hospital. Today, it is a 65,000 square foot residential treatment program for 215 adults and up to 50 children. At the same time, we employ almost 80 individuals, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have been doing this continuously since 1973 in Fresno. We are in the need of a chiller upgrade. A chiller is a massive swamp cooler. That's what they built when they built the building in the 50s. The chiller is no longer operational with cooling towers that leak, um, air handlers that they no longer make motors to replace or parts to repair, and it uses an extensive amount of water and chemicals to cool through the system and blow air into the rooms. It is not efficient cost-effective, and it's miserable in August in Fresno. We are asking for funding to re rebuild the chiller, upgrade it to an air-cooled system, not AC units, but um, it would remove the chilling tower, air, air pumps would blow cool air into the buildings, similar to an AC unit. Our roof will not support dual-pack ACs. Um, the number required would be too heavy. It would also require massive rewiring of the building so it was more cost effective to upgrade the chiller than to replace it with AC units. The second part of our proposal is to put AC units into the second building we have for sober living for 58 men. Um, it's out by Fresno State. It was built in 1963. It has tiny air uh, AC units in the windows and is not very effective in cooling the apartments. Four men share a two-bedroom apartment. They live there for up to six months till they get their feet on the ground, get a job, save their money, and move out. Its roof, like everybody else's in town, is leaking. So we're asking for some funds in this proposal for uh, AC units in each apartment and a new roof on the front and back portions where entrance and exits are and carports. And that's who we are. Thank, thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Ms. Pimentel? I got a question regarding the chiller is uh, when you guys upgrade it, um, it's going to be a lot more efficient. I mean, it sounds like that. 
Correct. Uh, how long are you expecting it to be efficient enough for that building? Well, we don't expect to expand that building anymore ever again. Um, it should last. And th there's a warranty, and I can't tell you the exact, but it's a 25 to 30 year guarantee that it's a whole new system being installed into the existing shell of our current chiller. So we'll have all new parts. We'll have all new access to replacement parts and repairs. Today, we do not. We have to We use one vendor who goes and salvages old chillers from other buildings in Fresno. And to be honest, they're running out. Um, we expect to die there. It's like pet cemetery. We got pets buried in the ground, and we have lots of babies born there. That's home. So we intend to stay forever. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, in this instance, although um, Lynn has presented as a combined on two properties, I'm going to review them separately because of the ranking in our um, funding recommendations. So for the first project, I'm going to do the MLK facility. Um, and some of this will, will be repetitive. So this is an eligible use. And uh, we do have experience with a similar project um, in program year 2018 with um, this agency. For um, one of them was for 40,000, another one was 120,000. Um, one of the projects has not expended any funds yet. However, um, it was, it was, the contract was just fully executed in January and um, we do have pre-construction meetings happening. So these are making progress. The other one has about half of the funding already expended. So it is already making progress as well. Um, the MLK facility, as I mentioned, is eligible and that concludes my comments on that one. Jumping over to the McKinney Plaza, Again, most of the other comments on um, past experience stands, but this one in particular, you'll notice indicates portions are eligible. And at the time that we prepared the packet, we were concerned with the carport portion of this application. Um, we were trying to determine through HUD regulations if because it was detached, that made it not part of an eligible process. So we have done a little bit additional research and as of today we believe that because it is a public facility improvement and not a housing improvement um, that it would be an eligible portion of this project but that is definitely something that we would want to continue um, to work with HUD to make sure of as we move forward. So I just wanted to explain the portions eligible comment in your package. Thank you very much. The next presentations that we will hear are regarding the CDBG public service um, funding. And so we're, we're going to begin with the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you and good evening again. Um, this is for the public services. The proposal is for the Boys and Girls Club to provide youth development services at three city-owned park sites. It's 1,350 kids that we serve, and their age is 6 to 18. These are at-risk and underserved Fresno neighborhoods, and they're at Fink White Park, El Dorado Park, and Inspiration Park. As you know, we began providing program services to the city six years ago at no cost to the city, with the newest site being the Inspiration Park, where we have four staff on a daily basis. We're asking for $97,500 total to support all three sites, which is about $32,000 each. We'll leverage the funding to provide public services in gang prevention, education, job, job training, homework help, and recreation for youth. These clubs are located in the most at-risk neighborhoods in the city and provide activities that enhance the city parks recreation program. We've been trying to support all three clubs on our own, and we did receive $75,000 this last year in the CDBG process. But with the rise of minimum wage and the loss of some funding, we're asking for your help with these three city-owned facilities. We provide the job skills training, life skills training, education programs. Um, in these geographic census tracts, the families are very low income, uh, we outreach to over 2,800 people, including um, youth that come to holiday events, 
Um, sometimes one adult in the family is incarcerated. With our inter prevention intervention, intervention services detailed in this proposal, children, youth, and their families will be provided with hope and opportunity in their own neighborhoods. Our programs and services both complement and enhance the existing city programs offered by the city in recreation and parks. We're keeping city-owned buildings open through hard fiscal times and continue to provide our services to at-risk low-income youth and their parents. We do have a diverse funding base with local foundations, corporate partners, and donors who contribute to support our services at those three clubs. So what we're asking is to leverage the CDBG funding to sustain services and programs in addition to the funding that we go and find. Um, the other final thing is program services are not duplicated. We're the only CBO with comprehensive program services unique, unique to these targeted children. With another year of minimum wage increases across our 100 employees in our organization, the shortfall increase is making the receipt of the CDBG funding even more critical. So we feel like we've stepped up to take over the responsibility of providing services, but we are a nonprofit asking the city to help coordinate with our agency to keep the clubs open and thriving. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. This is an eligible activity. And in 2017, Boys and Girls Club was awarded $33,000. They expended $33,000. Their goal to serve was 950, and they exceeded that by serving 1,199. In 2018, so that's our current year, so it's not over until June, um, they were awarded as she had mentioned, and Ms. Kara had mentioned, at $75,000, they have already expended $37,583. Um, again, the goal to serve there was 950, and I believe they've already exceeded that. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Kara Fresno. If Kara Fresno is not present, we are gonna hear from the Community Housing Council. That's fun. <laughs> Good evening, my name is John Shore. <clears throat> I'm the executive director and one of the founders of the Community Housing Council of Fresno. The whole idea of a housing counseling agency was born right here at City Hall with the prompting from HUD and the uh, Housing and Community Development Department. I'm proud to say that as one of the founders, we got this organization off the ground just in time for the foreclosure crisis that hit in 2009. We were funded very heavily to help all the families in Fresno who were underwater needing help uh, with mortgage modification, just knowing what their options are. But that's not all we do. We also do first-time homebuyer education. More and more of the programs that are being offered for first-time homebuyers require homebuyer education. Many loan underwriters, when underwriting and approving a loan for, I guess, what I would call a marginal buyer, are also requiring that that buyer take homebuyer education. Our classes are an eight-hour class that has been, the curriculum has been approved by HUD. We also do and continue to do mortgage default. I would think that at this point, after the uh, mortgage crisis has passed, that we wouldn't have people coming in for mortgage help. I have to tell you that it's pretty much an equilibrium. We have as many people coming into our doors for mortgage default help that we do for first-time home buyer. Now the sad thing is all of the funding, all of the federal money, all of the state money has gone away. So we're helping those people at, uh, out of our reserves. There's no funding and it is illegal to charge anybody for mortgage default education. We also do financial management. Those folks who want to buy a home and need help getting their credit in order, needing help in finding out what lenders look at, 
to approve a loan, we do that as well. We also started doing tenants education, helping people know what is right and wrong about what their landlord is doing. And one of the uh, things that we uh, started a couple of years ago, which has now become a HUD approved um, or, uh, activity, is we do loan document review. Anytime somebody applies for a loan, they're required to get a document uh, sent by their lender that lists the 10 housing counseling agencies in their neighborhood. We're always number one on that since we're the only Fresno-based housing counseling agency. So people come to us wanting to uh, use us as a trusted advisor, making sure their lender is telling them the true story, making sure that they know before they owe. So those are the services of the Community Housing Council. Proud to say that I've been with them now for 10 years of the 13 years that they've had an office here in Fresno. Thank you very much. Commissioners, any questions? Mr. Shore, thank you. Yes. Uh, do, do you issue them a uh, HUD certificate? Is that what that is? Yes, we have a, a certificate that... That they uh, take to their loan officer? That's correct. It's part of the loan file. And I might say that that has to include fair housing and fair lending education. And uh, we see, still see some violations in that area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, this is an eligible activity. According to our review, um, we do not have recent experience in funding this agency in the last two years. Um, but as mentioned in the presentation, um, there was perhaps a start with the city of Fresno and they have extensive HUD experience and they're already qualifying their services through the um, AMI. And so they're, they're very familiar with a lot of the same process that would be required through funding from this agency. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from the Fresno County Economic Opportunities Commission. Good evening, commissioners. Veronica Wilson, Administrative and Development Coordinator for Fresno ELC Street Saints. We appreciate this opportunity to present our proposal to you in the amount of $36,000 for support of our after school and recreation program. So this program was initially started um, in the back of a church just as a safe place for kids when they were out of school. So now we have grown into five community centers within Southwest Fresno, and those include Sunset Community Center, um, and we're also in the complexes of Big B Villa, MLK Square, Westgate Gardens, and most recently we moved into Hacienda Mirabella. So in our program, um, we provide homework assistance, recreation, um, we take the kids on field trips, and also um, they receive a hot meal, and that's about 100 youth um, daily in our after school program, and then in the summertime, we serve over 200 youth. So in addition to our regular enrichment services um, for the kids, we also have a summer youth employment and leadership development program, which is for six weeks for our teens. Um, last year, we were able to double the number from 25 to 50 participants. And, um, and in addition to the employment skills, in addition to the employment skills that they gained, um, our teens also learned about financial literacy, leadership, and nutrition with the 4-H advocacy and teen core curriculum that we use. So using this teens as teachers model, um, we now have our teens also working with our kids in our regular after school program throughout the year as well. And the CDBG funds um, greatly help support the staff and the cost of a stipend um, for two of our sites. So we really do appreciate your consideration of our proposal. Thank you. Are there any questions? Could you, um, you probably, um, it's the Southwest Fresno schools would, you know, which schools would go to this after school program? For Southwest Fresno, it would be Gaston Middle School and then also the elementary schools of um, King Elementary, um, West 
Fresno Elementary is over by Hacienda Mirabella, and then Sunset Elementary School um, is right next door to Sunset Community Center, and there's also a bus stop for Columbia Elementary outside of Sunset Community Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioners, this is a, an activity that is definitely eligible. There is the last two years of experience, 2017, the agency was awarded 39,400. They have already expended 28,928. They had a goal to serve 150 and have surpassed that by 233. In 2018, 36,215 was awarded. To this point, zero has been expended, but I'd like to comment that that is because this contract agreement was set to start in April 2019 because they are currently expending from their prior one. So it is only because of the sequencing of the agreement they have not expended that. And um, this is one of the subrecipients that has received a monitoring by our staff and it was a clean monitoring. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from um, Fresno Metro Ministry, food to share. Good evening, I'm sorry, did you say food to share? I believe it was our What's Cooking Fresno proposal that. So there's two listed here, and um, What's Cooking Fresno, as well as food to share. I'd, I'd like, I can provide some clarity, sorry. The, um, the food to share is the one project that we determined was not eligible, so they are probably not prepared to provide a presentation okay. this evening. Thank you. And then um, What's Cooking Fresno, I believe, is what we'll be hearing. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Kelsey McVeigh. I'm with Fresno Metro Ministry. Um, we are the initiator of the Better Blackstone uh, Community Development Initiative, which um, if you haven't heard about it, it's basically focused on encouraging equitable revitalization and reinvestment in central Fresno. And to do that, we're exploring a variety of themes and avenues, and one of those is um, economic development and specifically business development. And the project that I'm here to talk to you today is called What's Cooking Fresno, um, which is a tuition-free um, food entrepreneurship program that enrolls residents from low-income communities and equips them with the skills, experience, and local relationships that they need to be successful to launch a business or to go into um, food business management. Um, we select participants through an application process um, where we solicit applications, we bring them in for an interview, and um, we enroll them in the eight-month program. Um, we do intensive outreach through Central, Southwest, and Southeast Fresno to ensure that we're reaching those populations and finding those individuals motivated and really dedicated to um, a food industry career. Um, we also target individuals who haven't been able to make use of the existing services out there for reasons such as um, prohibitively high cost for tuition of culinary programs, or maybe they're una unavailable during certain schedules because of family commitments or other jobs that they can't afford to quit to enroll in, in daytime classes, um, or because of maybe their immigration status. Um, the, tr the curriculum of this program includes um, life skills, culinary and technical skills, business leadership and management, um, and sales and marketing. Um, we bring in local experts and experienced restaurateurs to help us with the curriculum and to tell their story and to really relate a lot of this um, specific industry knowledge to our cohort members. Some of the individuals we've had come in are Mike Sherinian from The Elbow Room, Liz Sanchez, the owner of Casa de Tamales, um, Alina Kumanesh and Fouad Safa from Deli Delicious Franchising. So a lot of great, um, great talented people that come in. Um, we have um, also the participants proceed through the Serve Safe curriculum, so they get instruction on that curriculum and are prepared to pass the exam to be a, ma a Serve Safe management professional. And then finally, they also complete 120 hours of paid work experience in an existing company, so they get that real world exposure in an existing catering company or restaurant. Um, and then finally, our two main partners that we have for this that we're really grateful to get to work with are the Fresno Adult School, who um, allows us access to a commercial kitchen and their food service instructor, and then also classroom space. And then finally, Fresno Workforce Development Board and Workforce Connection, which um, brings a lot of value to the program because those cohort members who are eligible are co-enrolled at Workforce Connection, and we can make use and leverage those workforce dollars for their paid work experience and their supportive services such as textbooks, uniforms, um, and things of that matter. So, Thank you. 
Commissioners, any questions for, for Ms. McVeigh? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, now, do, do you, are you accredited? Do you have a, an accredited um, part as far as the education is concerned? We, um, as Fresno Metro Ministry, are not accredited, but the courses that um, are the actual instructional courses are run through Fresno Adult School, and they are accredited. And so every um, participant that is enrolled in What's Cooking Fresno is enrolled as a student at Fresno Adult School, and they receive credit there. Um, and we have a teacher of record through Fresno Adult School, um, so it's on the books as, a, as an actual class. And they have their, also their experience running curriculums and doing student evaluations that we really tap into and use their experience as a uh, school. So as they leave, do you help place them? Yes, we do. Um, I ran out of time, but yes, we do help place them. Um, we get them plugged in over at Workforce Connection, and there's um, career counselors over there, and we help place them um, in jobs that, that also we know of outside of Workforce Connection. Um, so we basically um, talk about our program as like an umbilical cord to all of these individuals that we really stay tied to them and coach them through their, their process and their career and make sure that they are uh, on their way to something that's going to um, really deliver on a, on a career or a business launched. Right, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm just curious if there was a model similar to this that someone outside of Fresno County has already done and what is the success of that, if you are aware of? We, um, there are actually, um, I can't name any specific ones right now, but we've looked at a lot of um, incubator kitchens and incubator, food business incubators around the country who um, have told us, because that's our, our ultimate goal down the road, a lot of them have told us that they were not successful because they didn't have the training operational component done first. And so that was why we decided to design this training program and operate the program out of a bar out kitchen, the one at Fresno Adult School, before we actually build out our own, um, uh, our own permanent kitchen. Um, so we're, we're getting all those, all those worked out and the details of operating the training program, getting cohort members graduated, and then focusing on building um, a physical um, incubator space with a shared commercial kitchen and then um, incubation kiosks like vendor stalls. So. Um, do you happen to have uh, the placement rate by any chance? We don't because we're currently working with our first cohort right now okay. um, who is will actually be graduating next month. Um, so we're working through um, getting them completed with their work experience hours. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't have a placement rate right now, unfortunately, for you yet. Oh, that's fine. And, and then, you know, if I understand correctly, so the students in your cohort would be students at adult school as well? That's correct. Yeah. Um, and also, when you are thinking strategically, the placement, is it for someone to end up having a job in a restaurant or start a business? It depends on, it's a case by case basis, so it depends on where they are at, um, what their desires and, and aspirations are for, for their career, and it also depends on their progress through the business plan development because it is quite rigorous. So we have several that honestly have entered wanting to launch a business and they decide for themselves, you know, I'm not quite ready for that. I need to go work in the industry for a few years and work on launching a business down the road. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioners, we believe that this is an eligible expense and we do not have any prior year experience working with this agency. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Helping Others Pursue Excellence. Uh, my name is Lanisha Senegal with uh, Helping Others Pursue Excellence, and we are, again, representing the Vision View Vocational uh, Business Formation Center. Uh, we provide vocational training um, and business support services. The request that we're asking for um, to be able to provide su uh, support services uh, for our building small business capacity and job training um, 
services for the participants that we serve. Basically, we're in a very unique position to be able to focus on building capacity for our low-income Section 3 residents and business concerns. Um, by definition of Section 3, it's an eligibility set by HUD um, income guidelines. Um, HUD invests dollars in a city regarding, you know, maybe infrastructure, housing, or programs like CDBG, but the priority is to ensure that the funds benefit the intended persons, like low-income families. And so we've been able to really just focus on making sure that we connect those families to the opportunities that um, whenever those investments. So if, as like some of the other partners that serve some of these opportunities, like the, uh, the kitchens or the Boys and Girls Clubs, we um, also ensure that how do we align all of our services and work to make sure that we don't duplicate services. Um, we work with public agencies, contractors, and residents to ensure that if there's any program out outcomes that they're trying to accomplish, so let's say a contractor is seeking to find a contractor to uh, do business with, well, we match that contractor with that opportunity. Let's say a resident is seeking job placement assistance or maybe they need additional skill building services, then we provide the skill building service that they um, are seeking. So if they're seeking uh, maybe additional skills in electr electrical, well, we you know, try and match them with electrical opportunities where they can pursue their career uh, interests. Um, as well as those businesses that are interested in growing capacity. We help them with the legal infrastructure as well as um, making sure that, you know, it's something as simple as having a business card, being able to uh, get the insurance that is required to be able to bid on, you know, different contracts that the city might, you know, might have available. Um, the positive, again, here is that we had a tremendous opportunity last year. We were awarded uh, $15,000. We only intended to serve 15 participants, five participants, but we were overwelcomed by 82 uh, residents that we were able to serve. Um, this opportunity has allowed us to even leverage it even more with some of the public agencies like SBA, um, CalVets, which now we are now a, a considered a service a veteran service office uh, to be able to serve veterans as well. Um, so we've been able to really try and leverage the opportunity matching our contractors and, and small business uh, residents, low-income residents. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? In this particular program, how many people are you serving? Uh, last year we served 82. Uh, this particular program, we, ex we hope to uh, serve 40. So we set 40, but we are expecting to supersede that goal. Thank you very much. I have a question. Oh, so sorry. Right over yeah. here. Yes. And then the apprenticeship programs that you're talking about, can you be more spe uh, specific? Yes. So uh, whenever we think about apprenticeship, Let's say, for example, um, someone is interested in, like our major focus so far has been, how do we get someone to actually get their contractor's license? What has been happening is contractors across the city, big developers, you know, they get the opportunities in the, you know, the smaller contractors, they may not have the capacity or they don't have the license or they can't qualify for the bond. So we have been trying to find out ways to uh, make sure that that, that person has the skill training and the, um, and the support services and take the state test, um, as well as just provide on-the-job training opportunities, you know, in the local community so that they will be able to, one, additionally gain the hours that they need to be eligible because um, State Board of Equalization, I mean, not State Board of Equalization, um, California State Board, State Licensing Board requires that you have two years of experience in order to qualify for a license. So we want to make sure that that person, by the time that they get to that phase, that they have the experience required to obtain the license. But the whole goal is, again, uh, contractors have been saying, well, we can't find where people that we can, as a prime, how do we find someone who is a sub we're not, there's, there's a disconnect. And so we're just being intentional about helping the contractors meet the needs uh, that they're trying to meet their hiring goals as well as uh, their, their match goals. So if someone wanted to become an electrician, 
you would be able to provide that uh, type of training? Yes, so we match them with an organization that would be interested in that, spa in that particular um, mentee, or we call them all mentees. But what we've also been doing is, again, we've been creating enterprises on site. So we've been bringing in different professional um, instructors um, who have experience in maintenance. Maybe they do construction. We have a number of projects for that we're trying to you know, improve. We have, like I said, the coffee shop that they're getting ready to launch. We've been incubating them for a year and now they're getting ready to launch. So we bring in different contractors that are going to do the improvement, and then here it is, we'll be able to have someone to shadow them on that opportunity. Thank you. I also have a question. Um, Can I answer that yeah. response, please? For sure. One of the ways that we connect um, individuals with the apprentice program is that HOPE is recognized by the HUD registry for Section 3 as an organization that pairs prospective employees and those seeking construction type trades with the employers who need them. So we house a dedicated computer where individuals can walk in off the street and actually sit down and we walk them through the program on how to find the job sites that are hiring the eligible residents. The other way that we connect those individuals is they can actually go on our website and see that we're HUD Section 3 approved. So a lot of the um, opportunities for the apprentice program comes in through the general community via the HUD website, the HUD website, excuse me. I have two questions. So um, you partially answered the first one. Um, so you would, your, your class will be coming through the website, just the electronic information that's posted and what other ways um, do you do your outreach to engage? Um, is it like, you know, social security offices or people that um, need support in moving forward? And also, do you have any kind of relationship with the unions? Well, we have two perspectives of the answer, so I'll go first. Okay. One of the perspectives is through our partners with the housing authorities. Another is our relationship with various uh, general contractors throughout the city. Our relationship with Workforce Connection so the referrals will come from those individuals or those organizations. And the trainings that are available to them are also posted on the website. Does that answer your question? Yes. Um, with the unions in the past, we have developed a relationship. We are looking to, as we're building capacity of that phase of the program, we are looking to expand our relationship even further. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, how we're leveraging this opportunity is um, working with many of the public agencies, the contractors, and um, the residents, really just making sure that we provide a perfect match. Um, partners, again, like um, HUD, uh, Department of Transportation, Caltrans, Department of Veterans, Veterans Affairs, uh, they have all joined us to the table to say how do we create a streamlined process to be able to achieve some of the same outcomes that they're also looking for, forward to achieving. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Commissioners, um, we believe this to be an eligible activity and HOPE received um, a couple of awards. One was program year 2016. It was a $12,000 award, 12,000 was expended. And program year 2018, which we are currently in, uh, the award was 15,000 with an expenditure of 10,900. So they are on track. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Live Again, Fresno. Good evening. My name is Desri Almadier, and I'm the Director of Development at Live Again, Fresno. We are so excited for this opportunity to share um, our passion for the youth and families living um, in the very um, unique demographic of Adams neighborhood, more specifically Parkway Drive. Parkway Drive is the frontage road off of the Highway 99 between Belmont and Olive. On this three quarter piece of property, this block, there are 15 motel properties and approximately eight to 11 children living at each motel property. That means that right now there are over 100 children living on Motel Drive on Parkway Drive in Fresno. Um, National Geographic has called this area, this, this Parkway Drive, the Human Trafficking Corridor of California. 
So um, in contrast to the sex trafficking, the sex trade, to the gang activity, to the high drug involvement, um, crime, and generational poverty, in contrast to that, there are a group of beautifully resilient children who are high opportunity. And we believe that they are the future leaders of Fresno. And assuredly, they um, possess the, the solutions to what their community needs. So as stated, we are really passionate about serving the youth on this, in, this, in this area. And um, our after school, we have a, a threefold vision. And our after school program began in 2012 in the trunk of Richard Burrell's car. And because of relation-based, um, trust-filled relationships, it exists now as an after school program that meets bi-weekly. And for our core group of 25 children that attend bi-weekly, um, these activities consist of music, dance, art therapy, and currently we have a master's level intern in social work from San Jose State who is providing um, social, emotional, evidence-based curriculum that is really giving these tools, um, the children tools, to cope with their traumatic um, life and sometimes chaotic um, school life. So this is a third space that exists in order to, to serve them. Um, we do a lot of activities, outdoor play, because children are not children on Parkway Drive. They cannot just run outside and play. They are um, inundated. Right outside is, is a park parking lot, um, and it's not safe for them. So that's a large part of, of providing safety for them to grow and be themselves and hopefully um, change the cycle that they're in. Secondly, we're, we have an adult referral program that we have that exists because we want to serve the children even more where we come alongside their parents and connect them to services that, that are already offered to them. This means really practically going to the doctor's office, um, signing them up for immunization, helping them enroll the kids in school, being a support for them. And lastly, we do uh, a mobile food unit um, a route that actually goes into the motel properties when the kids have holidays and they're not at school and able to get their free meals, we bring the meals to them. So we've partnered with um, Fresno State University and the Fresno EOC in order to do that for two years. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, any questions? Well, you know, we probably all heard about Parkway Drive and I know that one of the issues that was very urgent was for the children to actually get to school going through all of yes. that craziness. Yes. And I'm just wondering, um, sometimes, you know, helping also needs to be safe. So yes. while providing so those services, you mentioned that, you know, you're considering safety standards, like how are you ensuring that the children are being safe while attending those activities? Because that's what was one of the things that that's okay. a great question. Um, we were able to purchase a 15-passenger van last year, and part of um, our request is to purchase another van. So we, we um, our, our staff or, and volunteers actually drive into every motel property. We pick them up, and we remove them from that setting. And right now we're meeting um, in our office. At, we're at, it's acting as our community center. So it's really important, like I said, to have that third space that's that they belong to, that that's safe for them to grow and really express the things that are happening at home and at school. So it's that's how we, we do that. Great, oh, that sounds great. And then, you know, obviously, um, just the, the larger issue is working with the parents. Um, what's the, you know, do you work with parents or yes. what's the, you know, could you yes. just talk about that a little? Yeah. Um, great question. I, I love this part. So when we say parents, um, we're predominantly speaking of mothers because the majority of our core group are fatherless. So um, this means moms because it, first and foremost, if there's no relationship, if there's no trust, there's really no way that we could help them um, because they wouldn't move towards us and they wouldn't move towards the 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 solutions that exist for them. So uh, we we spend time in the motels getting to know them. So I spend time getting to know the moms, I sit with them, I chat with them, I hold their babies, we, we just spend time. And then um, from, from there they, they express needs, they express um, desires for change, they express really practical, like I need to drive a ride to so and so. And so I just put them in my van and we drive them to, to the places they need to be, connect them to CCLS at times. So their needs are very different just as the children have. And so we're just connecting them to whatever they're stating their needs are is connecting them to those services. Thank 
you. Mm -hmm. Are you working at all with Adams Elementary? Yes, um, yes, and our master's level intern is, is there um, twice a week, I believe, pulling our children, um, our Live Again gr core group, um, out and doing one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions at, 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 um, at the elementary school. So we've been in collaboration with Fresno Unified School District. Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just very curious, um, <clears throat> how, how are you guys um, capturing your data if these kids are improving, because you guys are, are wanting to, to improve their living conditions? And health, and so I'm just curious how you guys are capturing that. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, would okay. love to. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity. That's a great question. Uh, so we spent a number of years in the hotel properties, meeting with moms, meeting their, meeting the children first, meeting their moms, and then family out from there. Um, in building those relationships, initially it was all about relationship. We. We did not understand, I did not, I take responsibility for it, I did not understand how compelling of a story you can tell with data, right? So in the last year and a half, we've been able to partner with uh, Anchoring Success, right, in ways to create Google Forms, right, so that we're capturing how many kids are showing up, what are their ages, what are their needs, are they asking for food, for more food? Uh, on a bigger scale than that, Fresno Unified Superintendent Bob Nelson and uh, Kane Christensen have been huge partners in helping us track attendance, right? Uh, they're keeping track of attendance. Uh, are, is attendance improving? Uh, grades, are grades improving? When kids transfer um, schools, they usually stay in Parkway Drive, but they transfer. We have students right now who are as far out as uh, Hoover High School, but still living on Parkway Drive. We've been able to help them uh, better track and, and keep those kids plugged into project access and whatnot. Um, we're getting ready to move into a new community center, a new community space closer to the kids, um, being able to serve more kids and, and their parents at like a way deeper level, more uh, private setting. Um, and in that we've already been assured uh, through some community partners that there's been 10 uh, computers that have been purchased that will be located there uh, Khan Academy and other, I'm not sure of the exact names of them, but I know one of them is Khan Academy that we'll use to track like literacy, um, math um, scores on their little, I don't know if you've ever been able to use any of that stuff. <laughs> they track the stuff. I don't, I don't know how to do it. I just know how it works. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And I think that a lot of organizations like school are really interested in attendance, um, you know, preventing truancies, but I think that that's what I'm hearing from you guys. You guys are wanting these kids to learn life skills and improve their living conditions. And I'm curious if you guys are capturing data that these kids understand um, how to get help, you know, when they're in a unsafe situation, especially in that area, instead of just, you know, the common interests of, of other organization, but really about how these kids could be successful in terms of their safety, in terms of um, making good decisions. So, you know, I'm just really curious if those are things that you guys will capture. Absolutely, so part of the uh, MSW's job is to, uh, was to go in and uh, uh, create a evidence-based social emotional curriculum, right? So she went, put the curriculum together and this is what she teaches. Um, a lot of it has to do with grief loss and, and things of that nature, bullying and those types of things. Uh, but a large, there are large sections assigned to um, specific things like stranger danger or unsafe situations. Both of these kids live in like, mm, I don't know like a nice way to say things that are going on out there. There's a large percentage of our kids who uh, have suffered different traumas and different types of abuses, right? Um, so <clears throat> as we collect the data through these, I could tell you a funny story. So we had this 16-year-old girl who shows up every week, never wants to be involved, always on her phone. We figured out a way to get her involved, put the Google form on an app, put it on her phone. So she takes the data. Each um, lesson that's being taught, it'll say this is on... Um, uh, like to report like unsafe contact or uh, stranger danger type stuff. This will be 
the title that's logged into that activity, um, how many kids were there, it would separate their ages from there, right? What did they learn from that? We're capturing all that data. Um, so it's attendance, food, what the specific lesson was for that day. Um, and again, this is twice a week we're doing it, so it's, it's pretty, it's a, it's a lengthy curriculum, um, but we're capturing as much data as we possibly can to be able to tell a more compelling story or more detailed story. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I have an idea of what um, you guys are capturing. Um, I'm just, to be honest with you, I'm really more interested in how are these kids better off in terms of, you know, the coping skills that they're learning, yeah. how to make good decisions. You know, I think school's going to be interested in attendance. And, For sure. um, you know, there's going to be life challenges that these kids are going to be going through. But my, my big interest is, you know, do they understand how are they going to be better off because of the work that you guys are doing? So maybe this will speak to that. Um, my personal experience, my personal life experience, uh, I wasn't taught unity. I wasn't taught trust uh, or any of these like really good core values from my home setting. I was taught that by my neighborhood, right? Um, these kids left to their own uh, resources are vulnerable to recruiters for the sex trafficking trade and for the gang, right? Um, being left to their own. I know for sure that for our core group of 25 kids who have been involved in our program for two years, when every Wednesday when we come together before we ask God to bless our food, there's this like deeper prayer, this deeper offering that comes when they start to express their own needs, right? And so I can say that for sure, lives are being changed, trajectories of young people's lives, kids who two years ago saw nothing for themselves at all, today want to be computer technicians. Uh, we were supposed to take a trip this spring to some NASA place down south, right? These kids have hopes and goals and dreams, whereas two years ago sitting in these hotel parking lots, they had no idea what they wanted to be and didn't really care what was happening next. All they wanted to know was, am I gonna eat today? Right? So they are for sure learning coping skills. They are learning healthy unity and community and family uh, at levels that I know for sure are going to impact them for years to come. Awesome. You know, I'm glad that you described it in that kind of way because that's, you know, for me, I think that that's the, the biggest impact that you can make is helping these kids kind of understand the route that they should be taking, understand what's safe, what's, what's a great choice, how to make decisions in complex situations. For sure. So thank you. Thank you. One more question. Do you have volunteers that help you with this? Yeah, yes. Do you want me to elaborate on that? Or? A little bit, please. Yeah, so um, every single one of us from our board, uh, employees, um, have all went through a term of being a volunteer. Uh, even like our closest board members served for two years as volunteers before they were considered to come onto the board. Um, we are really careful at who we allow to, because we call them our kids, right? This is our family. We are really, really cautious on who we allow to come in contact with our kids. So there's rarely this huge recruitment, um, volunteer recruitment call that goes out. Right, it's usually word of mouth or us speaking somewhere. Somebody hears and goes, "What is this? How can I? Um, how can I be involved with this program?" Again, we can create an online application where folks can fill this thing out. They agree to a background check. Further than that, we have a community partner who's agreed to do uh, the live scan type fingerprint, um, so that we can make sure, at least, do our due diligence to make sure that like these are safe people being around our children. Thank you. Thank you. All of budget questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how have you been funded for this past two years? And also, um, based on the budget, you're requesting 100,000, but the total bu budget is 349,000, is that correct? Um, yes, that was based on um, a skilled operation. So uh, up until now, we've been operating off of $80,000 annually. And um, the numbers reflected are w where we're s scaling to. So that's like a proposed 
um, amount as we scale, as we move into our new um, community center space that it's closer to Parkway Drive, that is where um, we will be operating at in, in, um, in contract and in collaboration with the Department of Behavioral Health as well. So given that, you, let's assume that you are getting the 100,000, mm -hmm. what particular portion yes. of the budget line items they would be spent yes. on? Yes, um, very good question. So we're requesting $70,000 for salary for the executive director who works tirelessly and is a servant leader to, um, to the children, and then $30,000 for the purchase of an, of an additional 15 passenger van. Since that's how we really access the children, we need to be able to transport them in numbers okay. to the community space, yeah, and on our outings. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, we believe this to be an eligible activity, and there has been no funding with this agency in the last two years um, or at any point that I'm aware of. Um, and I believe you guys asked all of the same questions that we had asked to be clarified, um, with the exception of the income eligibility. So that's just one thing that we would work with the agency should um, the commission recommend funding um, regarding how each student would, be, would need to be documented as being income eligible to qualify for these services. So we've covered it all. Thank you very much. Next we have um, before us is the Lowell Community Development Corporation. Hello. That's fine. Thank you. Hello. Thank you um, for being here tonight and hearing all of us. Um, we, I'm Esther Delahaye the Executive Director of the Lowell Community Development Corporation and um, we are in our second year now of CDBG funding for the tenant education activity. And so um, we are um, able to provide tenant education to renters across the city of Fresno, um, educating them on their rights and their responsibilities as um, tenants. Our workbooks that we um, each tenant leaves the workshop with um, is available in both English and Spanish and it is filled with a lot of information and resources for those tenants so they leave the workshop with tools to understand their contract to understand um, maintenance requests and how to do those and document things correctly um, so that they are being a better tenant for their landlord and they're investing in their rental properties and um, and they have the tools that they need to do that properly and document that correctly so that they are setting themselves up for the best rental experience that they can have in getting their deposit back at the end of their tenancy and um, leaving their place in the best condition that they can. So. Um, like I said, we're in our second year of funding right now. We are working alongside the neighborhood revitalization team as they move into um, different communities um, that are that are part of the Restore Fresno plan. Um, so we're working alongside the NRT as they organize resident groups in those communities. They invite us in to go in and do a tenant education workshop. So we've done that. Um, I've also met with the landowners um, and the managers in those areas as well with the NRT program to explain to them what we have to offer and it's been um, received very well. Um, what we've learned is we've learned that it works really well to work with other organizations and community groups that are already working with a group of people instead of us trying to do a big event to bring people to. And so um, we are trying to be more strategic with working with organizations that work with people um, placing them in housing or in transitional housing so that we can get um, folks educated as they're going into um, housing around Fresno. Um, and in the coming year, we're looking to expand those partnerships um, immensely. We also collect data um, with surveys, um, pre and post surveys, so we're kind of helping measure um, what the residents are learning through the survey, through the survey, through the workshops. Um, and if you have any questions, I would love to answer them.
Hey, what would you say um, are like things that 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 tenants don't know before the workshop that you would say this is specifically um, you feel confident that they are learning these things or you're surprised by what they didn't know? Yeah, so I think some of the biggest things is how to who's responsible for what. Um, many residents have a big contract, but they don't necessarily understand it all. And so the biggest number one is bugs and who's responsible for the cockroaches, the bed bugs, the mice infestations, those things. Um, also documentation. Um, residents don't know that they have the right to document um, kind of their rental experience and asking for maintenance requests and the processes to do that correctly so that it's not just the landlord's word against a tenant's word when it comes to a dispute of some sort. So those are kind of the big, big things. And habitability, many of, I would say, most 90% of the residents or more are currently or have lived in a non-habitable unit in the past six months. And so they don't quite understand what their rights are to ask for it to be habitable. I wonder if you get referrals through the city, through the Fresco application, because I know that a lot of, you know, um, tenants tend to use that application for violations and how do you respond to those? So we do not get referrals right now from the Fresco app. There is city staff that is aware of what we're doing. Like I said, we're working alongside the NRT team. And so um, when they become aware that there's residents who need, who would benefit from this, then they make that connection. Um, just this week we have two meetings set up with other organizations that heard about tenant education through city employees who referred them to us. So, um, so there is referrals, but it's not, um, it's not a formal process like through the Fresco app. And, and I wonder if the uh, ultimate goal is to keep the tenants safe and, you know, um, have all the basic needs that they need to be provided, provided, or potentially connecting them to also going through classes to become homeowners. Like, I, I wonder what's the ultimate goal. Yeah, so with tenant education, what, where we kind of started with that was we, we found a lot of residents not living in habitable conditions and not knowing what to do about it. And so this um, was one, one thing that we could do um, to kind of address that. And, and we've seen some great things happen. Um, so it's really meeting folks where they're at. Now the Lowell CDC, kind of our bigger vision for our community and for residents there is does include that home ownership piece and so i can't say that's for every tenant that we educate because some just need to know how to put in a maintenance request or how to contact the city of fresno if their landlord's not responding right um, but for the folks that we work with in our community there's much more um, relationship and focus on kind of that upward mobility, home ownership is a part of that, moving renters to homeowners and that sort of thing. So that is part of our mission, and as an organization, we try and do that in the Lowell community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioners, this is an eligible activity, and the city does have experience working with the Lowell CDC the last two years, as mentioned. In program year 17, the award was for $22,000, and over $18,000 has been expended to date. We had an original goal of serving 500, and um, currently we show that 80 have been served. And then in program year 2018, a $20,000 award with nothing being expended yet. And um, the contract, the agreement was executed at the end of 2018. However, we're still awaiting clearance on insurance before that can be authorized for use on that 2018 agreement. Thank you very much. Next, next we'll hear from Turning Point of Central California.
Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Jody Ketchaside. I'm a Deputy Regional Director with Turning Point of Central California. I oversee all of our housing programs for people experiencing homelessness. And today I'm here to talk to you about Bridgepoint. We have submitted a request uh, for $100,000 under the Public Services CDBG category. Um, Bridgepoint was uh, developed out of a community need for folks who are experiencing homelessness to be able to be someplace safe where they can work with the social service staff that are helping them work towards accessing housing. So a lot of times there are some steps that need to be taken in order to get there. And when people are sleeping on the streets, they become difficult to find. It's hard to make appointments. So we've, we've found that by implementing Bridgepoint, the path to housing was much more efficient. Folks were able to shower, get meals, and be able to um, do their housing searches and feel good about how they were presenting because they were able, they did have the opportunity to get clean. Um, during the last fiscal year, we served 107 people experiencing homelessness. 38% of those were chronically homeless, meaning they were disabled and homeless for more than one year. We had 56% of them were veterans, 41% were suffering from a severe mental illness, 25% were over the age of 60, and 60% of them went to permanent housing. And, the pa and it truly is a, a community-focused program. When it was developed, the Fresno Madera Continuum of Care providers came together and helped us design a program that everyone was happy with. And currently, we uh, touch bases with folks and, and take feedback from other community providers to help the program evolve and um, you know, meet new needs and adjust to new trends that may arrive. So without city support, the program is because we have a very, we have a kind of a hodgepodge of funding, we have various funding streams, but in the past, the city of Fresno's contribution has been really important and it is still very important. So, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Are you based locally or you oversee, like, is your office local? My office is local and right next door to the program that we're talking about. And I wonder, because um, obviously, you know, I, I see some overlay with other um, applicants that request funding for similar activities. Um, what's the, like, partnership with major players in this arena? So in the, in the past, uh, the project's been funded through ESG, which was done with a collaborative application with uh, Westcare, Pavarolo House, and Fresno EOC. This past year, it was funded with these CDBG funds. That, that contract was entered into at the end of last month. And um, so, it, I mean, it's, we are part of the Fresno Madera Continuum of Care. We are um, working with the navigators that are on the streets, doing outreach. They refer people in. All of our referrals come through coordinated entry, with us, which is a community system. So it's it's really current. It's currently the only bridge housing project we have in Fresno um, to date. So not necessarily prevention, but actually serving those individuals. Yeah, it operates similarly to a shelter. It's it's more like a, an emergency shelter. Folks I, are coming directly in off of the streets. I'm sorry, I have a question to the staff, but is it okay for me to ask it now? Um, I was wondering why um, they're not in the ESG. Um, are they ESG eligible? Just a wild question. <laughs> Correct, the, the activity is, um, So I, I, the question of why they're in the CDBG mm -hmm. category, that actually may be a Jody question because it, th there's no matching requirements in the CDBG program and that may play a role in their decision to apply, but they applied specifically for the CDBG program instead of ESG. Um, so I mean, Referring it, back it, it may actually be her question, but um, as far as eligibility goes, we didn't evaluate this for ESG eligibility, but it, it likely would be eligible as well. So previously we were funded through ESG and over the course of about, well, two, two and a half years, we um, lost a significant amount of funding in the ESG category um, through that collaborative application. This past year we submitted the same collaborative application with Westcare. They were the lead applicant and uh, the 
city came back with um, the idea of, of funding it through the CDBG funds. So yes, the lack of match is definitely appealing because the majority of our funds are either ESG or HUD COC. So it's difficult to match the HUD dollars and then match the ESG dollars 100%. Um, so this is a much better fit for the program. But initially it was um, something that we entered into after the ESG funding was lost. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, commissioners. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. This is an eligible activity. Um, the last year, 2018 award that was mentioned was for $75,000. To date, that has not had any expenditures in it, so we're behind on the budget side. However, I understand that of their goal of 112, that already over 50 have been served. And um, I, I believe Jody just mentioned that the contract was just fully executed back in January. So that probably plays a significant role in why the expenditures have not been submitted yet. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from the um, Valley Caregiver Resource Center. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Michelle DeBudio, Executive Director for Valley Caregiver Resource Center, and this is Yi Vu, our Caregiver Resource Program Manager. I want to thank you for allowing us to um, request funding for a Caregiver Emergency Intervention Program. And um, I want to start with by asking um, you, what resources do we have as a community available for our senior caregivers? And in asking that, what would we say? If I was the only one taking care of my husband, who has dementia and doesn't qualify for Medi-Cal, but I also don't happen to have $7,000 a month uh, to place them in a facility or to have care at home, where would we tell them to turn? This is the questions that Valley Caregiver Resource um, Center gets every day. And right now I'm gonna share with you a personal text that I got from this week from a 70-year-old gentleman dealing with a heart condition, and he's taking care of his 60-year-old wife suffering with dementia. So he texts me, this morning my wife's switch flipped again. Since she mentioned me, I'm sorry, twice she mentioned me like I wasn't even there and asked me where I was. She called me on my cell phone even though I'm in the next room. It's slowly killing me. For the first time in my life, I have absolutely nothing to look forward to except excruciating pain. I told this man that his wife will not always be at this place and he will connect and love her at a different level at some other point. And that's when he said to me, I'm not sure I'll make it till then. This is one story, and I promise you that's not a unique situation, but more common than most people would like to realize. Let me explain first that this man is considered a family caregiver, so he's not getting paid to do this, such as I'm sure some of you are aware there's IHSS workers that get paid to take care of their family member. So this gentleman's alone in his journey. And if you've ever taken care of a family member or spouse, then you can understand the growing issues that are plaguing our seniors and family caregivers. As a community, we can no longer ignore this mounting population. And let me just give you a few statistics of who they are and what they look like. First of all, there's over 158,000 family caregivers in Fresno City alone, providing an estimated $1.8 billion in unpaid care. The older caregivers have a 63% higher mortality rate than those who are not caregiving. 60% are women, and 75% of them experience uh, symptoms of se severe depression, and they receive little or no assistance from others. Valley Caregiver Resource Center is one of the few places that they can turn to, and it's known as the caregiver experts. The methods, that, excuse me, the methods that we use are proven to reduce caregiver stress, increase coping skills, and allow the caregiver to keep their family member longer. We've been advocating, empowering, and protecting seniors and their caregivers in the Valley since July 1988. We are truly a unique service. Sadly, we have never received any city or county dollars to assist our families. The Caregiver Emergency Intervention Program will increase the number of low to middle income families we can currently serve. We will assist caregivers in exploring immediate and long-term care options and provide support and guidance in decision-making. We'll provide means for someone to come into their home to give the caregiver a break, 
because how can one provide excellent care when there's no opportunity to rest? We also will give them specialized education and behavioral management. Stress reduction and other issues related to caregiving will also be made available through counseling, classes, and support groups. So at this time, I want to thank you for your consideration for this program. Thank you very Question. much. Um, commissioners, any questions? So, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioners, after um, review of the application, our team believes this to be an eligible activity. Um, however, I would just like to address that it's, it's going to be work to, with the applicant to determine it. We believe that the presumed benefit would be applied to the senior in who, the, the senior that would be taken care of. So it would not necessarily be the caregiver that would qualify, but we believe that because the life of the senior being cared for would be improved, that that individual would be who would qualify. So it is not a traditional sense of qualifying that we have worked with before, um, but after consultation with our consultant and some experts in the field, we um, believe that it would be an eligible activity, but there is no experience in the last two years working with this agency. Thank you. Next, we have Westcare, California. Hello again. Uh, so again, my name is Maria Rodriguez. I am uh, the program director for housing services with Westcare. And um, first, we're excited that uh, the city of Fresno has expanded their funding through their CDBG towards homeless services, and the, especially for diversion purposes. Diversion funding has been something that we hear about in other communities that they've been using successfully to divert um, families and individuals experiencing homelessness to be able to regain um, stable housing, and that's something that we have been lacking here in the community. So we're excited that it's included in this um, in, in this uh, CDBG funding this time around. Um, so we are um, we're providing services through other pro through other homeless services programs, we have identified gaps within the system, and this funding will help us bridge this gap by allowing us to help newly identified individuals um, with uh, rental assistance for the first month, be able to pay deposits if needed, um, provide transport, be able to provide for transportation costs, utility deposits. Um, so we're seeking $15,000 for diversion funding to be able to assist 12, again, newly homeless individuals and families um, to be able to provide linkages and financial assistance so that they can be able to promptly return to safe, stable, and permanent housing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we already have a high number of people experiencing homelessness here in Fresno in accordance to our um, 2018 annual point in time count. Again, it, we had eight, uh, 1,871 people uh, or individuals experiencing homelessness. So with diversion, we're um, hoping to be able to uh, not make the number go up or not increase our number of people experiencing homelessness in the community. Uh, with diversion funding, um, it's an approach where we're able to provide um, a light, type, light touch type of assistance um, to be able, again, to be able to divert um, people from entering into the homeless um, service system. So um, last year with uh, Westcare was able to bring trainings um, to the community and to other service providers. We provided uh, Two, two different types of trainings. One of them was diversion, um, diversion trainings to your community. One was progressive engagement and diversion. And then one that we provided in July was also motivational interviewing and diversion. Um, and then just want to mention that all the funding that we are requesting for is going to be used for uh, the direct financial assistance for the, of our um, program participants. The staff positions will be funded through other grants that we have been awarded, but don't actually include the funding for this type of assistance, diversion assistance. And uh, similar, we're also requesting uh, 50,000 in um, homeless prevention funding, so similar to our ESG. In that category, we requested the maximum amount, and we know that with providing homeless prevention, there's a high need here in the community, so we decided to also um, request funding under that category. Uh, in this section to provide additional services to 25 uh, individuals. Um, and, and let's see. Um, here in the community, we're also always looking for best practices to use to be able to maximize our program services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, we 
have found these to be eligible activities, and um, while I've explained um, in previous reviews the delivery of both um, budget and performance of services, West Care has been on par, um, but we do not have experience working with diversion with them, but again, their, their other experience finds them to be on budget and on task. Thank you very much. So we, um, we had to skip earlier Care Fresno, and so um, would it be okay if you shared with us what, what the staff found? Certainly. I forgot to ask that earlier. So with Care Fresno, um, we found it to be an eligible activity. Um, just some notable comments. We, we, we had some questions um, that I don't know that we were able to get addressed, um, but we clarified the number of centers with them because there was some confusion in their application. Um, they were able to let us know that it was for six learning centers and nine teen classroom centers, but there were still a couple of locations that they had yet to be determined. Um, and then we had some questions over the rent. It was not clear if, if individuals from the agency were living at the apartments or if they were simply offering services in apartments um, and not living in them. And so we weren't able to clarify that, um, but we did find that it is most likely gonna be an eligible activity if we could work with the applicant and understand a little bit better their scope of work and the, the few concerns we had about um, that I just had mentioned. Yeah, and there was no prior year experience working with them. It's, it's a relatively new agency from our review of the um, application. And so we were just wanting to get a little bit more information because we weren't sure about their capacity to administer a federal program and the sophistication for documenting that. Thank you very much. I believe that concludes all of our um, presentations, public chat, um, presentations. We are going to take a break. And so it is now 7.44, and we were hoping to take a 15-minute break. Is that still sound good, commissioners? Yes. So we'll come back um, at 8 o'clock. Does that sound right? So thank you, everyone that has come and has stayed to hear the other presentations. I, um, I, um, I appreciate my the services that you provide, my neighbors um, participate in your programs. I, I know a lot of you work collaboratively with each other. And so um, thank you so much for applying, for um, willing to, to um, go after these funds, and then all the work it's going to take, of course, to, um, to fill all the requirements and to have these funds. So thank you very much. So you're welcome to stay and hear when we come back. Otherwise, um, it's. It's fine if you, if you don't. <laughs> so have a good evening.
Okay, welcome back. Um, thank you for being here still. So this is um, the part of the Housing and Community Development Commission meeting where we are going to, as commissioners, discuss um, funding recommendations. And so we are literally about to just enter into a discussion and work amongst ourselves right now about how we are about to do this. Every year we do these things a little differently, and so this is how we're doing it this year. And so what we have in front of us are um, the categories um, as folks presented, as well as um, just like the amount that has been, I mean, we, first of all, we, we all were given um, this nice booklet with your applications um, very well um, put in here so that we can we see consistency and um, look at the information. And so now what we are tasked to do is look at um, the categories, those what folks have asked for, and then the funding recommendation, which is usually less than um, what people have asked for, what the request is. And so as commissioners, we are going to, um, we're going to try to match those somehow. All right, so is that, does that sound correct? Thank you, Mr. Tato. Um, so commissioners, we're going to, should we begin um, with the list as it was presented to us? Would that be helpful? Wonderful. Okay, we're going to start with the home repair um, presentations with Habitat for Humanity and self-help enterprises. So if you can pull sure. that sheet or however you were keeping uh, notes. Commissioner Fisk, if just one moment. I believe another commissioner has a comment. Oh, yes. Thanks. Sarah Frisk, I would have to recuse myself from this category. Thank you so much for doing that. So we have before us Habitat for Humanity is requesting um, $656,726. Self-Help Enterprises is requesting $502,000. I always forget how to say these numbers out loud. I should know. $502,422. So um, the ask, the request is just about 160,000 more than funding and recommendation. And again, this is based on what we believe um, we will be receiving from HUD, which is, has not been finalized yet. So commissioners, I am open to your thoughts, recommendations. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel that we should uh, fully fund self-help enterprise. Um, you know, they've been on par with all of their projects. And I feel that what they're trying to do is very reasonable. Um, um, you know, assisting 15 uh, households with the five components that they're really targeting. and. And I think that um, because there's a funding recommendation, I, I think we should just go ahead and go with that. And that would leave uh, Habitat for Humanity with We're all checking the math, so. The math does add. Yes. And, and let's let me clarify one thing on self-help enterprises. Exactly how many houses was that? It was for five components of their buildings? Was, um, So 
So on page 119, hmm. at the top of the page. So instead of um, units, it, it's, it, there were certain amounts that are categorized into five components. So housing rehabilitation up to 60,000. Um, emergency home repairs up to 15,000, roof, roof repair and replacement up to 20, minor home repair program up to 20, lead-based paint, um, lead hazard testing abatement up to 20. I have a question for uh, the city attorney. We have to put these into a motion. This commission is uh, tasked with making a recommendation today, so I would recommend that um, they be placed in the form of a motion. There are a couple of options procedurally. Um, since these categories need to be taken up separately due to the recusal of one commissioner on this item, probably the, the most clean option would be to vote on each um, category, make a motion for each category as to how the, how the commission's will is. So we would make a, um, regarding specifically home repair for um, programs under CDBG, we'd make a motion, maybe on our, yeah, I would recommend um, to make a motion as to the will of the commission on the home repair category, and then when Commissioner Hartunian returns, then you move to the next category, and each individual category would have a motion, a second, and then a vote. So it sounds like we have a motion on the table. Yeah, a motion. I'm going to motion for us to uh, fully fund uh, self enterprise the. $502,422, and then also fund Habitat for Humanity for four ninety seven five seventy eight. dollars I will second that. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion on this motion? All right, all in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 So I believe we have all ayes. Thank you, commissioners. Could one of you ask her to step back in? Thank you very much. Chair Fisk, if I could just address the next category briefly before the commissioners go into discussion. Um, the ESG funds and the HOPWA funds that are up next in the homeless services category, um, these are both unique in that the categories within the funding source are capped based on either HUD or continuum of care um, rules. So. Um, I just wanted to make sure that like on the ESG, the spreadsheet, you'll notice that, for example, Marjorie Mason Center at the top of the page um, under outreach and emergency services is also at the bottom of the page under rapid rehousing. Those categories where it says the funding recommendation need to stay pretty firm within the categories. As adjustments are made by the HUD allocation announcement, the recommendation that you do will go up by the percentage 
of each category. So it, the, the percentage of the overall categories will remain the same and can't be exceeded. Um, but for example, if HUD were to say ESG gets more money, then each funding recommendation made tonight would go up accordingly. So I just wanted to clarify that these are unique, these are two unique programs that have further caps on categories within the funding source. Um, and many of you are familiar with this from doing it for several years, but I just wanted to point that out again. Thank you. So commissioners, let's begin with the um, outreach and emergency shelter category. We have three, Marjorie Mason Center, Pavarillo House in West Care, California. Um, the request is for more than the funding recommendation. So any thoughts, commissioners? have a recommendation to fully fund Pavarello House. Um, allocate 18,000 to Westcare and 152,220 to Marjorie Mason. Um. What was the, the number again for Marjorie Mason? 152,220. So that's 152,220 for Marjorie Mason Center? Correct. And that plus 18,000 for West Care Center and 15,000 for Pavarillo House does total the 185,220. You want to fully fund Pavarillo and West Care and then the balance to Marjorie Mason. With just a slight exception, if I heard correctly, that um, West Care would not be fully funded. It was around $18,000. 800 short. 189 short. So instead of the 889, it would just be 18,000. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> just rounded. Yeah, no, I, I just feel like, you know, that would be my recommendation. In discussing this, <clears throat> the Marjorie Mason Center handles so many people versus uh, what these other two, all three of these organizations are fantastic. Yeah, um, my, my reasoning behind it was that in the first category, it, it is outreach and emergency shelter, whereas in the next category was rapid rehousing. You're correct, yeah. I, th that was my reasoning, but you can definitely overrule this recommendation. <laughs> Just having a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I got a question for our staff. Um, Pavarello House, the last two years, uh, was funded and they haven't really spent that money. Um, can you share with us the reason why that hasn't been executed? So, um I mean, what, what I can tell you is that we've not received the invoices. So um, any further explanation than that, I, I really, I, I would have to pull in our program manager that works with them on a daily basis, but we, we've simply not received the invoices. I mean, there may be more behind that, but there's no other reason that I'm aware of. It's not in an instance where it was a late execution of an agreement or anything of that nature. I have another question for you. I heard at least three times tonight, maybe four, that some of these companies um, were delayed because of insurance. Is that insurance they're acquiring or insurance that you're, that they have to have? It is insurance that the city of Fresno requires and that they are acquiring. So so both. It's on their shoulders. It's on their shoulders, correct. And we do include in all of our NOFAs, for example, the insurance requirements. Um, but I also appreciate that we're a very large organization and we have 
very high requirements. And for some of the smaller agencies, there's some capacity that needs to be built to meet those requirements. Thank you. So we have one motion on the table. Um, do I have a second? I'm going to second it. Thank can you, you. Can you repeat the motion? So the motion, the motion that we have on the table is um, just starting at the top. Marjorie Mason Center um, recommends one hundred fifty-two thousand two hundred twenty dollars. Pavarello House fifteen thousand dollars. West Care, California, eighteen thousand dollars. Any other discussion regarding that motion? You know, I was just going to add a little bit to why um, I second it. Is Parvarella House, you know, even with um, working with foster care youth and emancipated youth, I think that that's one of those areas where it's very difficult to find them support and and for them to be providing that services and also um, being one of the only organizations that provides uh, temporary um, housing for men with children. And I think that that's a great need here in, in our valley. Any other um, further discussion regarding this motion? All right. So let's take a, a vote on this motion then. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Looks like all, all ayes. So we've made a recommendation for an outreach and emergency shelter. Thank you. Next, we will discuss the, um, trying to match this to both of our pages here. Is, is homeless prevention HOPLA? No. Oh. Thank you. It's not on. <coughs> so no, the homeless prevention of um, the $25,075 is related to ESG. Thank you. So if we follow, I was looking at the, I was looking at the wrong sheet and I found it. So um, yes, I didn't think it was. So, so now let's look at the hot one. We have one um, applicant, West Care California, um, requesting an amount um, that exceeds the funding recommendation. They're requesting $499,903. The funding recommendation is $484,906. And there, Commissioner, if I could just interrupt, um, it's the purple sheet that, um, that was before the ESG. I think you are looking at the hot, yes, the one that you just turned to, the purple with the three bars. It's the middle bar of purple and the homeless prevention, the request from West Care was $31,479.98. And the funding recommendation is $25,075. Okay. The, I believe you were looking at the HOPWA. Yes. Spreadsheet. So let's set that one aside for just a moment if we can. So if I'm following this, is this where we are? So if you're following this, Marjorie Mason, Pavarello House, and West Care all presented on ESG. So if we could just stick with the ESG oh, thank you. funding yes, thank you. category, that would yes. be helpful. The three different categories for ESG. I would move that West Care California um, be given $25,075. Second. I have a motion and a second um, for West Care to receive the $25,075. Any further, any discussion on that motion? None? Thank you. So um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So it's all ayes. Thank you. Uh, moving to rapid rehousing, we have Marjorie Mason Center um, requesting $203,000, $203,287. West Care California requesting $249,630.73. Um, this is over the funding recommendation. Um, by over $100,000 easily. So, um, commissioners, any motions, any recommendations?
I would move that Marjorie Mason Center be funded to 175,000 even, and West Care California be funded to 121,920. I will second that. If I understand correctly, the motion is for Marjorie Mason Center to be funded at 175,000 and West Care California um, to be funded at 121,920. Correct? Correct. Thank you. So I have a, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this? Okay. So all in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It looks like all, all ayes. No opposed. Now that we have used, we have um, recommended on ESG, now we can move to the hot bar. So before us, we have um, applicant West Care California requesting $499,000, $499,903. The funding recommendation is $484,906. Commissioners, um, any motions? I will move that West Care California Inc. be funded at 484,906. Thank you, we have a motion and we have a, um, a second. Any discussion on this item? So all in favor of, of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All in favor, all ayes. Thank you. So next, commissioners, we are looking at the facility, CDBG facility improvement presentations. And so, um, so we have like seven um, applicants. I'm requesting funding total of $1,329,633. Um, recommending funding recommendation from staff though is is quite a variance. It's half a million to a million. So, um, Ms. Hurtado, can you if show? I could us? elaborate. Yes. Um, so I would I would recommend that the commission um, put the funding recommendations um, up to a million dollars, but I would ask that this in this particular instance that they are also ranked so that if cut significantly, this would be the category most likely that they would be cut. So it would be helpful for staff if we had an idea of the order in which the commission preferred funding these agencies under this category. Okay. Then um, I have another question before I let commissioners possibly ask you more questions. Um, and the, in the, with the applicants that have portions eligible, do we know which part of their funding request? I forgot to write that down if we had mentioned that. So I could go down the line real quick for you. So for the Fresno EOC, the shelter, um, the portion that we were concerned with was the phones, and we estimated that at $10,000 based on their application and follow-up questions. The Hope roof repair, that was the instance where I mentioned that we have determined approximately 92% of the facility is CDBG eligible activities occurring. So I would suggest that you could consider, you would consider the 92% of the request. And I can do some math in a minute if that is helpful. 138,000. Thank you. Next was um, St. Rest's Community Economic Development Corporation. 
And that was the one where I had mentioned there was some concern with the non-permanent fixtures. And I do not have an estimate um, for what that would be. The, the budget detail wasn't sufficient to come up with that. However, if I recall, nearly $40,000 was for a canopy, which we were not concerned with. So it would be um, minimal, I would assume, the tables and chairs and umbrellas, that portion of the request. Last was Wesley, no, not last, sorry, Wesley United Methodist Church. And again, the Wi-Fi and the thrift store were the eligibility concerns. And I don't have enough information in front of me to see how much of that $81,000 that could represent. Um, but I might be able to come up with that when I stop talking. And um, West Care was mentioned, but that was the one where I commented that because it's a public facility improvement and not a housing project, we believe the full project to be eligible. And um, we're no longer considering that the carport being detached played a factor. And I will look to see if, as you guys are discussing, I'll see if I can um, give you any information on Wesley. And then I, I have another question for you after old sign. You want me to ask the question? So um, looking at the West Care um, MLK project, the chiller system, this, this, is, this almost feels like one of those larger projects where we, um, like a street rehab in West Fresno, where we wanted to apply significant amounts of an award knowing that it would take them time to get it all. Um, is, there, is that possible with this type of an award or does it have to all be spent this year <clears throat> or within the fiscal so year? The city does have the option of and often does do multi-year projects. I don't know how feasible that would be for the replacement of a chiller. I, I don't know that. I know that for a large couple million dollar roadway reconstruction, that's often feasible because design is involved in environmental assessments and some pretty complex um, work before they can even get to doing construction. So multi-year and multi-phase projects works in those situations. I don't know enough about their project. Um, it may simply be the purchase of the equipment is really high and then it's just labor. So I don't know that they would be able to spread it over multi year, so that's that's really not something I can fully address for you, but it's allowed. Thank you very much. Um, just a note on that, so that facility is serving the Hopwa individuals? No, it is not. I believe that's a rehabilitation facility. So my understanding is that if you are 100% funded by the CDBG, that particular thing can only serve CDBG eligible programs, right? Like the chiller, for instance. It would have to be, if it's because it's almost 100% funded by the CDBG. So, so it, the question would be, um, is the purpose of the facility an eligible use for, um, are, are they providing CDBG eligible activities? 100%, almost and, yeah, 100%. Correct. And so we believe in this instance that they are. Okay. We have no reason to believe otherwise. Yeah, thank you. The reason I was asking, because a lot of agencies apply for different funding and they have different other programs that are not CDBG, so I was just wondering if their programs will be CDBG 100%. And, and just because they're funded by something else, that doesn't preclude them from being eligible, the activity right. being eligible. So the, the funding source doesn't as matter as much as the activity, the service that's being provided, and the oh. clients in which they're serving. Yeah, thank you. And on the, um, the Wesley, request for 81,000, the budget detail shows that the data and communication equipment is estimated at $1,000. So that much I can give you, and I'm still looking to see if there's a further breakdown in their application for the three different buildings.
staff, can I ask a question? <clears throat> Two of these uh, particular requests are for roofs and are the, the least the testimony that I heard is they're leaking now and they're going to cause further damage. I'm familiar with the Boys and Girls Club. If that floor gets wet, now you would have to replace the floor, basketball court. So um, how fast could, if we, want, if the city council went ahead and approved this or the mayor, how fast would they get the funds? So I can um, not commit to when HUD will be announcing the allocation or any future council action. But if we were to submit on time by the May 15th deadline, as we have done the previous years, um, our contract award date by HUD is typically in September or October. Um, so we could work with our team and their team to discuss if there is an urgent situation to discuss um, some potential pre-award opportunities um, because we can typically, as long as we've done the environmental and it's cleared and it's documented properly and it's eligible, there may be options to um, do that a little bit faster, but it's at the risk of the city and it's, it's not something that we typically do. So, I mean, it's something that we'd be willing to look at, but it's more than likely October, September or October before we could even um, present them with a contract for signature. Thank you. Next rainy season. And commission, just to close the loop on Westcare, I am unable to provide you any further details based on the application for Wesley and the amount that may not be an eligible activity. You know, I'm gonna motion for us to approve um, 140 for the 140,000 for the Boys and Girls Club, 215,000 for Fresno EOC, 120,000 for Hope, 35,000 for St. Rest Community Economic, 60,000 for Wesley United Methodist Church. 80,000 for West Care, uh, California, Inc. And um, 350,000 for West Care for the chiller system. I'm sorry, I missed you. I missed you on uh, helping others pursue excellent, what was that one? 120,000. Res is thirty five thousand. Run through that again. Starting at the top. Okay, starting from the top, Boys and Girls Club, one hundred and forty thousand. Fresno ELC, two hundred and fifteen thousand. Hope, one hundred and twenty thousand. St. Res. 35,000, 
Wesley United, 60,000. West Care Inc. for the AC and carport roofing, 80,000. And then West Care California, the chiller system, 350,000. Commission, I've just double checked and that's an equal, an even one million. Correct. <clears throat> I'll second that. We have a motion with um, many amounts. Um, we've also been, and we have a second. Thank you. We've also been asked to rank these, these folks. And commissioners, I don't know um, that, that how challenging that may be. I, I just, I'm hoping to get an <laughs> understanding of things that are, um, if, we, if the staff is in a position where we have to cut half a million dollars from this category, where we don't have to randomly select. So I'm just hoping to find some sort of direction from this commission. Um, so it, it, it can be general, um, but if, if you could prioritize, that would be helpful. It may be completely unnecessary, but it would be helpful. So the, um, the question, I just to review again, the average score that we have before us that the staff presented, was that based on um, things like your belief that they, they have the capacity to handle federal funds and the process that that ent entails? So the, the staff evaluated the organizational capacity, um, the needs that were addressed in the <coughs> application, the impact and the outcomes. Um, cost effectiveness, the leveraging going on, and then also the coordination and collaboration of the application. So those are the main headings of the, the score sheets that we utilized. And we were familiar with uh, many of the projects whenever we did them um, because they've got past year experience. Um, and we also did a lot of follow up with the applicants if we didn't feel that the application addressed all of our questions thoroughly. So yes, it was um, on all of those factors that we evaluated, but capacity and timeliness and ability to um, perform with the federal funds was all taken into account. And um, the reason why it can go back to half a million could be uh, because of HUD or because of internal decision? So um, whenever we get the allocation, there's some things that are that are capped or have certain percentages that they can't go over. So those those um, categories don't get impacted quite as hard um, because this is our largest category of kind of money that can go to nonprofits. Um, it, it's just likely the one that would be impacted the most should there be a reduction in our allocation. Again, I'm hopeful that there won't be but um, it would just be helpful to know, given that we don't know the allocation today and we're making this decision. And ranking them, we can just one through seven? Certainly, yes. Now, if we take the staff scoring, that would be one way of ranking it. In past years, we've done our own ranking added it on to the staff ranking, <clears throat> and then we came up with a ranking that way, where we were weighing in. But here I feel like, you know, what was useful last year when you added all of our rankings in, then you had a sense for where the commission was. But this way, when we're not doing it that individually, I have no sense. So then I look at how staff is ranking these and thinking maybe this is the way we have to go. I'll also say that last year we didn't necessarily say let's approve all eight out of the eight. If we had a limited amount of money, we said, okay, we have considered these our top three or four. We will start awarding it based on our top three or four and then the rest we we did not so we're kind of in a different place this year right. and and also i feel like you know um this this year and and just to preserve the um the 
the idea that I have about this body and serving on this body is also to um, give opportunity for um, new applicants to also pursue CDBG funding for um, developing the communities. And, um, you know, there are some new applicants that are serving um, a very significant portion of the city that, you know, is, is meaningful. So. Um, I would assume that the average score that the city has given to those new applicants is just based on having no no experience of working with them and how they would um, how they would work with federal funds that scoring might as well just change after they receive the funding and work with the funds for the fiscal year you know I just um, want to say that when I look at this um, purpose of the activity and why they're asking for the fund, a lot of these uh, organization here, like Boys and Girls Club, Fresno ELC, they're looking to rehab their facility so they could provide the services. Um, and I, I think I would base my ranking based on how it would, the function of the repair or the, uh, the funding will help with uh, their services in terms of uh, like West Care, California, the second one, the AC and the carport roofing, like I felt like that wouldn't impact the services that they provide as much. Uh, it would definitely help, uh, you know, and then looking at the chiller system, I'm like, that's for the whole building, uh, how uncomfortable that would be if they don't have that. So I would rank it based on uh, their need and how it's gonna impact the, the work that they provide to our community. So, you know, I'm just gonna share a little bit of what, how I kind of rank this. I, I actually look at Boys and Girls Club with the traffic that they're getting and the roofing and how they're closed down, like that's number one priority for me. And then going down to the chiller where they have staffs working 24 um, seven, uh, needing to be in a comfortable place, that would be number two, to Fresno ELC, rehabbing a shelter, you know, transitional age youth would be in there to four with Hope with their, their roofing, five with the building we have with Wesley, and then six would be the light power canopy with uh, St. Rest, and then seven would be the carport with Westcare. So if I could, so if I could repeat going down the sheet in the order that it's in, you're saying as far as rankings, Commissioner, one, three, four, Six, five, seven, two. Correct. Thank you. Commissioner Farrar, do you um, you seconded um, Commissioner Vang's motion? Do you still agree with that with the ranking? Now with the, the ranking added. Yes, because it's almost exactly the same way I'd rank them. <laughs> well, great. So now we have a motion. We have um, funding recommendations and ranking um, recommendations. Any discussion on this motion? I've got a question on the chiller. Hmm. So you're, you're basically rebuilding it. You're, you're putting something in whatever was housing the old chiller. And they're saying it costs Four hundred twenty-seven thousand six hundred eighty, and you are funding it at three hundred fifty thousand. So they're going to have to make up the difference. Otherwise, in my mind, I'm thinking they still don't have a usable chiller. Right. So the potential is that this money will be unspent till the next. Unless they make yeah. up that seventy-seven thousand, uh, you know, using their own funding. Yeah, and we're, we're yeah, we're talking shovel readiness, right? And, and commissioners, just to chime in, it doesn't appear that the um, applicant is here to address if that would even be feasible for them. I would just want you to know that um, in instances in the past where a lesser amount has been recommended for funding, staff has always gone back to the applicant and determined if it was a feasible opportunity for them before we pre went further in the process. So you're saying that they might lose the funding altogether? No, no, I'm saying that we would go back to them and we would work with them with the new 
recommended amount mm -hmm. and determine if it was still something that they were interested in pursuing or if the reduction meant that they were no longer that's, interested that's in pursuing it. Yeah, so, so we would work with yeah. them to help determine if that was the case. And um, in several years where that has happened in many instances, um, I can't think of one where the applicant declined the reduced amount of funding. So we, um, we have a motion and we have a second. Um, any other discussion or new motion? Call for the question. Thank you. So um, all in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. All in favor, thank you so much, commissioners. Okay, so now we are, um, we are looking at the CWG Public Service Funds. So sorry about that. We have several folks, um, several applicants. Commissioners, if I could just add um, on this one, the ranking is still over here and it says if applicable. I would just like to add ahead of time that that's not something that is necessarily required here because if you'll recall in public services, it's capped at 15%. And um, so the a reduction in allocation doesn't impact this category as much. So I believe that the challenge will be before us to get it down to the $200,000 range. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that I don't believe a ranking is necessary on this spreadsheet. We have 11, so there's, so um, Fresno Metro Ministries food to share, that is not eligible. So we have 11 applicants for this category. And um, yes, so we have 809,350 dollars um, requested and we're being asked to make a funding recommendation of 200,000. So, um, so commissioners, I've, I've actually waited to give my opinion till the end on a lot of these categories. Something that I've, I've noticed over the, um, the years of sitting on this commission that as folks have applied and we have not awarded them funds, I have been so appreciative to see them come back. And, um, and for whatever reason, you know, to show that they have better capacity or um, just continue to, to come and request funds. And so I see that, um, I see that here tonight and, and I appreciate that. I know that we, um, these are all very good programs. We can't fund all of them. Um, and I hope that those who, who didn't get the funding um, will try again next year. I know there's, it takes a lot of work to submit these applications. It takes a lot of work to then fulfill your obligations if you receive the funds. So I um, just wanted to say that as we go into this conversation. To those that are still here as well as the commissioners.
can I ask a question? <laughs> Sorry for keeping everybody waiting so long. This is such a tough category because of the um, limited uh, fund being recommended. Um, if West Care, California, um, Homeless Prevention Diversion Program, if they're, you're still here, I got a question for you. Thank you for waiting. Um, I know that you guys are asking for 75,000, and I know that based on your presentation earlier, all of that fun is really for the, the services of diversion. It's not for, for staff or anything like that, right? Right. Okay. So if you don't get the full 75,000, how would that impact you running that diversion program? Well, for the diversion program, if we don't, can you ask the question again? Sorry. Yeah. So, if you don't get the full seventy-five thousand that you're requesting, how would that impact your ability to run your diversion program? And commissioner, before she answers, if I could just address, I recall that the seventy-five thousand dollars was broken into twenty-five thousand for diversion and fifty thousand for, for homeless, homeless prevention. prevention. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I was looking at the diversion piece and okay. that was on yeah, my no, note. Yeah, no, the diversion so. is just the 25 and then the homeless prevention is uh, 50,000. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. You know what, thank you for clarifying that. I note it down differently, so. Oh, okay. Appreciate that. No problem. Commissioners, uh, I go back to 2011 in doing these particular uh, funding things, and I would make a suggestion that we take four or five of the top, since we're, we've got such a large, I mean, 809,350 versus, and we only have 200,000. So look at the programs, maybe the top four programs, and look at the impact they'll have uh, for instance you know again boys and girls club 1360 kids and uh, there's others in here they're all very good programs but every time I've worked the numbers I run out of money so fast I can't see straight so I would I would, I would counsel you to say take the top four programs that you feel and come up with a, a number for that. I agree with that. You know, with 11 programs, you've divided the 200,000, that'd be about 18,000 per, and that's just not doing anything. So, this is a tough category. You got way too many applicants with so little money. So, Commissioner Ferrara is right. We should just look at the, our top four or five. We've done that in past year, so. Commissioners, another option would be um, to do, you know, something similar to like a forced ranking system to where we just took the top two and you ranked number one out of the two and then you just went through it a couple times if you were having challenges coming up with the top four or five. 
throwing out some other options. I, I can see that this was quite a struggle. Do we just throw out our top four or five? Is that how we want to do this? If you would prefer doing that, absolutely. You can do that as well. Okay. I'm just going to share my top four um, in the order of one will be the Boys and Girls Club, two, Fresno ELC, three will be West Care, and four, Turning Point. Can you repeat that again? The top four for me would be in the order of one being Boys and Girls Club, two, um, Fresno ELC, three, West Care, California, and four, Turning Point. I'm ready to make a motion. Are we going to gather people's? Or is your motion reflecting to things, rankings, or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go right ahead. Thank you. Boys and Girls Club, funding is 60000 Care Fresno, funding is I don't think he, no. he ranked care for us now. I got to go back to the calculator. Okay. Sorry.
Bob's figuring out his math. I'm just going to, I'm going to motion um, Boys and Girls Club 65,000, Fresno ELC 25,000, Turning Point 65,000, and West Care, California 45,000. And I believe that's 200,000. You go through those numbers again. Boys and Girls Club, 65,000. Fresno ELC, 25,000. Turning Point, 65,000. And West Care, 45,000. That was a motion. No, oh, I was going to second it. Do we have a motion and a second? Um, any discussion on this motion? Well, I'm, I'm still driven by the numbers. Um, I just feel like, you know, Boys and Girls Club, they serve so many children, and we're significantly cutting that funding. Um, I at least want to put it out on the table before we go with a motion. You know, I agree that we are cutting the number. Um, it's really hard with the 200,000. I, there's several organizations here I feel like they're deserving of us funding, but then with the lack of fund that we're, we actually have available, I think that in order to make the most impact, I, I felt like this is probably the best way we could split the pie here. <clears throat> and we're cutting all of them. We do, yeah. It's just... Because if you didn't cut them all, then you would probably have to look at just three. Right. When I do look at the average score there, basically EOC and Boys and Girls Club are at the top. This is also reflecting the number of individuals that unduplicated that they serve. I think um, we've been, a couple years ago, we were um, even considering what it would look like to, uh, knowing that HUD funding may actually be completely cut. Some of our right. decisions were to, um, to cut into some programs um, so that you know, asking city council to find other ways to fund them, um, not wanting to rely solely on CDBG funds for some of these other programs that aren't before us today. So it is, it is a really tough decision to make. Um, and, I mean, the reality is um, these fundings are, are coming from outside of the city. So it is, you know, it's a city concern um, that we, we, we have a lot of needs and have a lot of really good programs that are developing even with the lack of funding. Um, so we do have a, a limited pot here to make a decision about. Let it go. I had to say something. No, I appreciate, very much appreciate you saying that. So we, we do have a motion on the table. Um, any other discussion? Any other motions? Okay, so all in favor of, should I repeat the motion? Is that helpful? Okay. So what we- um, Yes, I'm sorry, Commissioner, it would be helpful to repeat the motion and then clarify if there's a second. Okay, great. So the, the motion that we have before us is um, a warning recommending Funding um, for the Boys and Girls Club of $65,000. Uh, Fresno um, County EOC 
of 25,000, Turning Point of California, Central California of 65,000, and West Care of California of 45,000. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. So, um, so we have the motion by Chair Vang and Second. And seconded by um, Chair Reyes. All right, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All voted, so all ayes. <clears throat> Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, applicants. Thank you for all that you do for our community. Thanks. So before um, we adjourn this meeting, it, I want to open it up again for any public comments. Um, usually at the end of our, our meetings, we have a, a time for general comments. So if there's something that you would like to um, say to us commissioners um, about any of the proceedings that have happened tonight, about the process, anything, we, we'd like to hear it and um, it'll be <coughs> recorded. So. So any comments on any of the actions that we've made tonight? Yeah, please feel free. Thank you. Ms. Senegal, if you could state your name again. Yes, uh, Lanisha Senegal with Hope, helping others pursue excellence. Um, although I appreciate the uh, hard, hard job that you all have to be able to score as you did, that was tremendous. Um, I do, however, I just want to share the sentiment that although when we look at numbers as a way that we measure people's impact, I would encourage that um, in future opportunities that we, if we could add the measure of the quality and the type of sort of things that we're really focusing on. Here it is, our unemployment rate, 13% and, and higher in, in some demographics. And when we think about the number of, you know, whether or not are we gonna focus on, not, not that I, because I work with Boys and Girls Club and stuff, but when we think about the number of kids that are playing, it's a prevention, but then there's this, so it's the, it's the up and down, um, uh, positive and negative of, of you know, the, the effect of what's just happening in our community. But um, one of the other requirements by HUD requires us to be able to, whenever they invest funds in our city, that uh, there is a set aside dollars that are, requ are required for um, section three hiring goals or, or um, program allocations. And so I would just ask that we would consider those types of things when we, you know, um, in our scoring next time. But thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Would anybody else like to make a public comment at this time? Okay, seeing no other public comment that I've misplaced. Oh, here's my agenda. So that was our um, unscheduled oral communications. Commissioners, do you have any items? Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, just one uh, suggestion for next year. This last year we were scoring so that <clears throat> we were able to come up with a, a ranking just because we were scoring. <clears throat> but it might be beneficial next year if we do a forced ranking per category. It's a lot simpler. And then we could collectively see our commission is thinking. Otherwise, I'm trying to guess what the rest of you are. are. I, yeah, I appreciate that very much. I, I, I hope it's been very clear to the public that us commissioners do not, dis, do not discuss these items outside of this public time. So it, it does make it a little difficult to, um, to have these discussions. So... Yes, thank you for that, that um, suggestion, that recommendation. Under the commissioner items, if I could just add to, um, there is, for the, for the commissioners, hand delivery options for the agenda packet for the next meeting, the special meeting on the 20th. So we've got the materials printed, um, and you can take them home with you tonight if you're interested, instead of having us put them in the mail. Thank you very much. I'll, yeah. I'll take my set tonight, too. All right, so if there's no other items, um, 
No, so that was that could probably go into informational reports. So our next meeting is um, scheduled for next week. It's a special um, housing community development meeting. It's a it's a public hearing on. Um, it's a public. It's the housing element annual report. Thank you. The housing element annual report. You're all welcome to come back for that meeting. So I don't have a gavel, but. Um, if before you adjourn the meeting, if I could just let you guys know too that the. Special meeting on the 20th was called, and there are no agenda items currently planned for the 27th, which is your normally scheduled regular meeting. So I wanted to give you the heads up at tonight that it is likely that that will be canceled formally through our legislative center process and email notification. But right now, we do not have any agenda items for the March 27th meeting. All right. Thank you very much. So um, tonight's meeting, Housing and Community Development Commission meeting, is now adjourned. Thank you.